Mrs. Taylor, Mrs. Zahn. Here. And Mr. Bellman. Here. We have a quorum and may proceed. Resolved that the Board of Education approves the public session minutes of the August 3rd, 2020 board meeting. I will second, Mr. Brzee. Mr. Bellish. Yes. Mr. Bishi. Yes. Mr. Brzee. Yes. Mrs. Chu, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here and I, yes. Mrs. DiMaggio, are you on the line? I think she's just dialing in. Can we give her- I'll come back, I'll come back. Mr. Franco. Yes. Mrs. Taylor, are you on the line? Mrs. Zahn? Yes. Mr. Bellman? Yes. And Mrs. DiMaggio? What am I guessing? I'm sorry. The minutes. Yes. Motion passes. Correspondence on information. Dr. Mingo. Thank you, Mr. Bellman. Uh, nothing to report in the HIV information section or the suspension report. From, uh, for board correspondence, the board received two emails regarding the middle school yearbook and two emails regarding reopening plans. I also shared with the board the communication log since the last board meeting of other reopening questions, 44 emails from parents with reopening questions, one community member offering to donate PPE, one community member offering to donate tech support, one parent offering support, and 13 staff members, four notes of support and nine reopening questions. That's it in correspondence and information. Thank you very much, Dr. Mingo. President's remarks. Good evening and welcome to our August 17th meeting of the Warren School Board. We are just three weeks away from starting our new school year. Some of you may have noticed that professional sports like baseball, basketball, soccer in various countries, even the Formula One and Daytona 500 racing have restarted. They certainly look different. Our school this year will also look and feel different for our children, our teachers, parents, staff, and administrators, but all are working hard to provide our students the Warren experience while keeping the children and the community safe. This evening's presentation is focused on the distance learning component of the upcoming term. I'm looking forward to that. And I hope that all of you can enjoy the last three weeks of the summer break before our students will begin their new forms of school. Thank you. And with that, I hand over to Dr. Mingo for the um, superintendent remarks. Thank you, Mr. Bellman. So we are in that time of year where um, some of our regular back to school things are happening. Our new staff induction program is taking place later this week, led by Mr. Cook, principal of Mount Horeb, and Mr. Heaney, principal of Woodland School as well as lots of other support there, hiring still in full swing and all the other back to school um, components of getting ready for the reopening. I did wanna mention a couple of things that have come up in the last week regarding reopening plans, as I'm sure everybody on the call is aware, Governor Murphy in a press conference last week talked about districts having the option if they could not meet health and safety guidelines of asking for permission to stay in a remote learning for some period of time. There were no changes to the actual guidance to school districts. In fact, as of 7.05 today, we have not received anything from the Department of Education since the governor had that press conference with more information about it. Um, our plan had already been submitted to the executive county superintendent and approved, showing that we can comply with the state's guidelines for health and safety. So we're still uh, full steam ahead with our plans for the hybrid reopening with the full distance option. What we did get at the end of last week that's been very helpful is a new set of guidelines from the New Jersey Department of Health. Uh, that's a 19 page document that came late in the week with specific suggestions about the templates of letters we use to announce uh, if there's a, an exposure or a presumptive positive case, um, assisting data, which will help us decide when it's safe to move across the continuum, which is something we've all been asking for and, and we've heard from the community as well, where they will identify in three county groups what your level of risk is, and there's a chart in the Department of Health guidance of what that means for schools. That's all available on the Department of Health website and will be updated weekly, as well as guidance for how we can best support contact tracing. All that information has gone to our return to school subcommittees for additional work um, to help guide 
what will be coming in two weeks at our August 31st meeting, which is a presentation about health, safety, and operational uh, considerations for the reopening of school. Tomorrow, as you all know from um, Friday, uh, last Thursday's communications, tomorrow all parents will receive uh, communication which tells them what cohort their child is in. So it'll confirm the distance learning model or the hybrid model. For those families who chose the hybrid model, it'll tell them which of the AB cohorts the student is in, including some attachments with information about school start and end times, including the distance components at home. Uh, the AB schedule that carries us, you know, which days are A, which days are B, when do the Wednesdays rotate, that sort of thing. There is one little uh, additional wrinkle to that, which is the governor also announced somewhat unexpectedly that all schools must close their facilities on election day this year. So um, it sounds like that will be a distance learning day for everybody in New Jersey, but we don't actually have additional details about that yet. It's a little bit frustrating for us because that we don't, we don't use our schools as a polling place. So the fact that we wouldn't be able to have kids in on November 3rd um, doesn't maybe match our reality, but that is guidance that we're still trying to, to sort through. So all that information will come out in a letter to, to parents tomorrow, along with information of how parents can request changing either from distance learning to hybrid or vice versa in the process we're going through that. That will follow up with next week, Letters Home announcing homeroom teachers, um, which is our regular course of action as we get through the month of August. And I think that's it on the return to school before I turn it over to Mr. Kimmick. The other topic that I want to mention is the middle school yearbook. Mr. Villar sent a letter home to middle school families at the end of last week, communicating about an inadvertent yet inappropriate use of religiously themed bordering around the eighth grade student pictures. He and the yearbook advisors are working with our vendor, LifeTouch, on solutions to that issue, and we'll be back in touch by the end of this week or early next week as soon as that is finalized. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Bellman. Thank you very much, Dr. Mingo. Moving on to item eight on the agenda. Presentation, distance learning overview. Mr. Kimming. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen for a moment. Um, can you confirm that you can see that properly? Yes, we can see it. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, so I wanna thank everybody for the opportunity to uh, present tonight. Uh, really the overview tonight is going to focus on uh, hybrid and distance learning and what those characteristics will be that uh, will define the way that looks within Warren uh, for the upcoming school year. I think what's helpful to take a look at is just to recap uh, what we discussed uh, about last spring and the way last spring looked and some of the challenges that uh, the district had and also the work that uh, took place to address some of those challenges uh, across the spring and also uh, currently across the summer. So as everybody will recall, uh, we were forced into a distance learning environment very quickly last year. As a result, a lot of our efforts initially had to be very reactionary to really a rapidly changing set of parameters and guidelines from the state. And it was really something that was forced upon us. And, and again, it's something that, that we worked hard to increase our capacity. We worked hard again to address a number of challenges that were very unique challenges to school systems. And that was not something that was unique to Warren, but it was something that a lot of uh, really good work and hard work uh, uh, occur to address those those challenges and, and again uh, provide opportunities for learning that uh, perhaps uh, were something that we did not anticipate at all to start of the school year last year. Another very large challenge that we had last year that, that uh, we are thinking we can proactively address this year going into the school year was we had very limited access to paper-based resources last year. Uh, if something was not brought home by a student on the day that we closed last year, as you'll all recall, there was really no way for us to easily get those resources to students. And, and every parent in the community sat in a car line at some point to either drop off materials or pick up materials. Those were all systems that we had to create across the school year last year. So those were significant challenges that, that we continue to work on uh, throughout the spring and, and now are also having models that we can use that we can apply into uh, this school year. So we feel good about uh, some of the work that took place to, to address those areas and, and are some things that we can fall back on in terms of having structures and, and capacity to uh, address challenges that um, you know, will not be unique to this year. Another issue that we had last year was our learning management system. Uh, when we think about how we house all student learning in a digital platform, uh, Google Classroom is something that had been used last year 
in grades three through eight for the most part. It was not something I would use in our K through two classrooms because that was not something that we were in an in-person environment really stressing as a necessity. Uh, when we transitioned to full distance last year, we had to make a lot of adjustments into, to how we were actually storing information, setting up assignments for students, that type of thing. That work will be very consistent from the onset of the school year, year this year. So when we think about uh, our learner management system, we are a Google district. So Google will be something that will be used really K through eight, and we will have devices set up to actually address that going into the school year. And we will have systems set up that will be communicated to students and communicated to families clearly at the onset of the school year. When we think about last spring, we also did a great deal of work in terms of creating professional learning structures, creating um, student environments, and also providing professional development to really increase our ability to think about distance learning expectations and approaches, really think about asynchronous tools and video resources that we could use to uh, develop flexibility in terms of how material is being uh, prepared for students and organized for students. So a lot of those resources that are listed on the screens were areas that teachers did not have uh, a lot of expertise in and developed their expertise as the spring went on. So we're, we're looking forward to relying on that expertise that was developed and the hard work and successful work that so many teachers did across the spring to be able to use those resources to really balance our instruction this year. And, and, and that goes along the lines of the common synchronous video tools. When we started with Google Meet at the onset of uh, distance learning last year, there were a lot of challenges associated with Google Meet. If people will recall there were challenges associated with Zoom for other districts. A lot of those um, challenges have been addressed by Google, by these other companies, so we have increased flexibility going into the school year in terms of how we can use those resources and do so successfully. And then when we think about just the way that we can use some of these digital tools along with paper-based resources uh, to actually conduct assessments and, and provide students feedback, uh, a lot of great work occurred around that as well when we think about the, uh, the way that the spring unfolded. And then things like ClassLink, our single sign-on service, and the way that we roster, a uh, tremendous amount of work has taken place around that, uh, really in the spring and into the summer, so there's, there's more of a seamless kind of approach that is occurring with that as well. So in terms of recap, I just, I just give this context because I think it's important for people to recognize that a, a, a tremendous amount of work took place last spring. That work has continued over the summer, and we're trying to, again, not be reactionary now, but be much more proactive in the approaches that we're using, planning for the fall. Uh, 2020 and, and spring 2021 school years. When we think about just the hybrid and distance learning overview, uh, this graphic again is something that we've developed as just a one-page reference that, that families can have in terms of looking at the way that we're uh, defining hybrid and distance learning across the course of the school year. And you'll see surrounding all of the, the six major areas is this idea of looking at uh, embedded professional learning, support and collaboration to really make sure that the, the quality of the product that we have for students and families is something that we feel strongly about and we feel is going to be uh, something that our people, um, again, appreciate and, and is very student-centered. When you think about the six areas with inside the blue square, the idea of networking of teaching teams and atmosphere and landscape and culture, social, emotional and academic climate, instruction and support and daily schedules and student responsibilities, those are all critically important to the student experience. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, I'm not going to have this slide up the entire time. I actually have a slide prepared for each one of these areas. So when I click off the screen, if people haven't had a chance to read this whole thing, we'll talk about each one of these in a bit of detail as we go through the presentation. But really, these six areas become critically important to the way that we think about the approach that we're going to be using with students uh, within the school year. As a bit of a backdrop on this, again, if we think about the 2020 schedules, uh, this is something, again, that Dr. Mingo mentioned that uh, this information will be included in the letters that go home uh, to families regarding the cohort assignments and, and the setup for the school year. If you, think about the, if you think about the 2020 schedules, this set of schedules right now is for hybrid 1.0. And I think that's very important that, that families recognize that. We talked about that continuum of, of instruction and continuum of models that will be used this year. We are starting in this idea of hybrid 1.0, which is, again, this idea of a single session day that does not include a lunch, uh, but does address each core area within the school day. And again, this outlines the time that students, when they're in school, will be in the facility itself, but it also outlines the time that students who are at home will be expected to be logging in and actually participating in the same schedule that students are participating in. You'll notice that students will have a break in midday 
And that's typically when buses are traveling and moving students back to their homes. There is a commitment in the afternoon that we expect students to follow through on, which is when they log in and they have a related arts or a special area in the afternoon. So you can see the school day doesn't end at necessarily the early dismissal time or the, the end of the day here when students are in person at 1240, for instance, at the middle school, it actually ends at 230 when students have finished that afternoon login. To, to piggyback on this, uh, principals will be developing detailed schedules that will be communicated as we have in past years. So it's very clear at what time a student is having which course or which subject area uh, across the morning and uh, afternoon times as well. When we think about leading into daily schedules and student responsibilities, when those schedules are communicated, the expectation is that in-person and distance students will follow the same daily schedule. So students will be expected to log into their device if they're at home at the start of the school day. They'll complete the same morning routine that students that are in person are completing. And then there'll be some type of a daily synchronous classroom meeting that will involve both groups of students at the same time. That will be something that will set the tone for the day, will create connections for students at the onset of the day, and then actually define some of the work that is taking place across the day. Students will have common responsibilities and expectations for the daily work, uh, regardless of the setting that they're working with them. So if they're at home, they have the same set of ex expectations for completing work that the students at school have. And then the sequence of instruction is the same for all students as well. Uh, I think it's really important that we think about this idea of what changes for students is the location, but the expectations and the responsibilities that students have actually apply to both locations if they're participating in a hybrid where they'll be at school and at home or if they're full distance, it applies to the full distance location as well. When we think about a network of teaching teams to support the schedule and the instruction, we've actually tried to look at ways that we can reassign staff and reallocate staff in ways that will create co-teaching teams uh, that further reduce the student teacher ratios for each grade level and for each team at the middle school. So when we look at that, principals are working hard to actually arrange in environments and staffing so all students have a degree of co-teaching within their schedule. So there's a shared responsibility uh, among those co-teachers to actually deliver instruction, to conduct assessments, to actually work with students, and it increases the opportunity for uh, you know, more small group and synchronous work that can take place between students and teachers as well. When we think about just resources for teachers, we have a lot of work that's taken place this summer around developing uh, planning and guidance resources that support common priorities for teachers and provide structures that will provide a type of uh, continuity of approaches across the elementary and the middle school teams. Uh, it's important that people recognize that we have a number of 12 month employees, obviously, that, that are uh, always working and coming into the district, but we also have a number of 10 month employees that have been working very, very hard over the summer developing and committing their talents to actually developing the resources for their colleagues. And uh, that's something that uh, we will have prepared for staff when they, when they come back to school. So we're able to uh, provide supports for them, develop common languages and actually common approaches that, that can be used. Collaboration becomes extremely important when we think about that model uh, for teaching teams to be successful and for them to really engage students and support students, we have to make sure that we're developing time and opportunities for staff to collaborate well together, plan well together, and actually work as teams. That really is something that has to be supported by the cultural foundation within the buildings and within the classrooms. That's one of the great things about Warren is, is we really feel strongly about the building culture, the classroom culture. This becomes incredibly important when we're talking about uh, hybrid and distance learning, because this idea again of homerooms be, being divided into essentially two pods of students, one pod being in person and one pod uh, being at home, we have to think about how we can promote connections for those students and make all of them feel connected on a daily basis to the work that's being conducted within the classroom. So that becomes very, very important when we think about the instructional and management strategies that we want to use to promote that common classroom culture across both pods. And that's some very intentional work that's taking place in terms of uh, this idea of classroom community building, this idea of focusing on making sure that students feel connected to one another, connected to teachers, and have opportunities for uh, things like those morning meetings that will set a tone for the day and provide connectivity for students. 
the norms and the routines are something that are consistent for all students, regardless of location when we talk about culture. We want all students engaging in things like classroom meets, regardless of where they are. So it becomes important that we, that we establish the expectations for students around that, that parents are also clear on that, and that uh, that becomes a routine that students can rely on and feel supported within. That's also supported by this idea of focusing on social emotional learning, because social emotional learning needs to, again, support the academic climate within the building. Uh, the literature has been very, very clear about the idea that when students have been out of school in the way that they have, we have to make sure that we understand that we have students that are coming from all different conditions right now. And we want to make sure that we have supports that are set up for those students. We want to make sure that we're actually addressing the transition back, back to school in a way that, that provides a degree of, of structure for students, a degree of safety for students, and also just a, a a very intentional addressing of emotional wellness for students. And that really ties into classroom culture that supports socialization and supports overall academics. And it's important that people recognize that in that onset where we are having a focus on that social emotional support system for students in order to really, again, support the overall academic approach that we're using. A big part of that is also engaging students in reflection and engaging students in personal goal setting so they understand that they have a very active role and a very uh, big part of owning the learning that's taking place within the classroom environment as well. When we think about instruction and support, uh, this obviously is the core of the academic portion of this. When we think about a, a typical school year, Usually we're going to be looking and saying that it's going to be instructional strategies that are based on very intentional uh, sound pedagogical decisions that teachers are making. The big difference this year is that we want to really focus on the transfer between in person and distance learning settings. We don't want students to feel like distance is so different than in person that it's not accessible in the same way. So that transfer is something that will be very explicit within the work that's done in person so students can kind of have that skill set when they go to the distance learning environment. For students that are full distance, they'll also get the benefit of engaging in that very intentional type of discussion that's occurring around how are you using the, the tools that we're providing for you in a way that's very intentional. When we think about students receiving a blend of daily live instruction and support from teachers, and asynchronous independent work that actually models what takes place in a regular school year. When we think about uh, the work that that occurs on a typical school year and on a typical school day, it's very rare in a K environment that you would have somebody in lecture for 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, we really try to design, especially in our younger grades around the idea of a mini lesson that depending on the age of the students may last from five to 15 minutes long. And then students would typically break into center work or they would break into independent work or some type of guided instruction with the teacher in a small group. And I think what we're looking at is, is a model that allows us to replicate that in a way that actually will be familiar to the teachers and that for most of our students will be somewhat familiar to them as they, as they navigate their school day and the types of things that teachers are uh, planning around. When we think about atmosphere and landscape, this really gets into this idea of collaboration. And I'm focusing on teacher teams collaborating daily, but I think it's this whole idea of also uh, growing in our ability and our capacity to have students uh, begin to collaborate and work and use tools in a different way as well. So, so that in any typical year would be something we would build up to. And that's the kind of work that we're talking about this year as well. Our overall goal is to plan and deliver learning experiences that are meaningful, that are motivating, that are challenging for students, with really a focus on engagement. And, I, and again, I think students engage regardless of, of what that looks like. They're going to engage in a way that is, uh, again, engaging from a point of view of ownership, or they're going to be engaging from a point of view of not being as uh, involved in the learning process. We want one that is, is really focusing on the idea of ownership and students having uh, meaningful engagement processes for themselves. So to do that, we really feel like we have to focus on formative feedback for students and one that really zooms in on individual growth and creativity that's supported by the idea of having summative uh, assessments that are taking place at different points as well. 
So as I started at the beginning of this, I mentioned that embedded professional learning support and collaboration surrounds all six of these elements of hybrid and distance learning. It's really important that the community understands that, that we are in the process of developing common professional development modules uh, that will support the transfer of blended learning strategies for, for students and for, for staff. So it's, it's something, again, that we're proactively looking to say that these are tools that staff needs at the onset of the school year, and then we're going to define also what staff needs across the school year to continue to expand our abilities in these areas. Our first days of return, of return to school planning guide is being developed right now. That's going to support, it's going to be a, a fairly uh, elaborate document that supports common planning strategies and instructional continuity, but also provides staff uh, many tools and many points of reference that they can use, uh, again, to focus on that, that collaboration and that common planning. We did a lot of work around identifying additional common assessments instruments that we can use this school year. Um, again, a lot of what we had in place in terms of uh, elementary assessments that were common assessments in the past were very much uh, focused on teachers having conversations with students and being very close to students when they were doing that. Some of those strategies are not possible within the current uh, environment that is being suggested with in school and also at home. So we have some common assessments that are going to be administered to all students at certain grades across the district. So they'll be again uh, opportunities for us to monitor how we're doing in terms of, of student growth, to be able to pro provide parents with information at regular intervals in terms of student growth, and also be able to reference back to standards and growth monitoring as we're working across the year on that. The all aspects of the hybrid and distance learning really require coordinated planning to best support students. So that's where that daily collaboration time becomes very, very important for staff to be able to uh, really work as a team because this is a little bit more complicated than a, than a typical year. And what we're suggesting is the co-teaching model will continue to provide uh, better supports for students, but it also requires staff to uh, just again plan a little bit differently so they're actually defining things very intentionally for themselves and for students. The, the proficiencies that staff developed last year with tech tools in the spring will really support the work that we have going forward. Uh, some of those tools have also uh, provided updates and have changed somewhat. So while they're the same core tool, we're going to continue to provide support for staff in terms of the, the types of work that they can do with those tools. And again, really look to kind of push that to the next level with regard to uh, staff being able to use that to support their own blended learning. An example of that is Google. Google uh, is now changing the way that meets are going to be organized. So they came out with a, a different level of, of Google Meet that will allow eventually, not at the onset, but eventually allow breakout rooms to take place. Uh, again, allows teachers to have different controls that are set up over to Meet uh, to really, again, make sure that the type of environment that students are learning in is one that's safe, but also is one that uh, can be very intentionally designed for the teacher. And that gets into the last point about sound instructional decisions being very intentional and being guided by common professional learning, a balance of resources, and strategies that promote engagement and connection for students. So the question around what if we have to transition to full distance learning? As I mentioned at the start of this, our hope is that we move across our continuum from hybrid 1.0 to hybrid 2.0, and we're increasing uh, how often students are in school. But there's always a chance that we could end up having to go to full distance. If that were to occur, we really feel that at the, at the onset of the school year, in the hybrid model, all students experience a degree of distance learning. Uh, if you're in hybrid A, you're going to be distanced two or three days a week, depending on the week. The same thing with hybrid B. So we have the opportunity to provide students uh, the supports that they need to kind of understand how to manage and how to, how to navigate the distance learning environment. So, so it won't be so foreign to them in the way it was last year. It's something that will also be very familiar to staff in terms of the, of the constructs that they're using to structure the day for the students. I mentioned this before about the, the goal of promoting transfer of strategies between in-person and distance environments. And that's why this becomes so important because we know that, that students will be living in both worlds uh, from the onset of the school year. If we had to go full distance, we can rely on the distance environments. If we end up expanding the amount of time that students are in school, we can rely on the in-person. But there has to be a connection between the two of those and we feel like that will support any transition that would have to occur to full distance as, as we were to go through the year. Uh, the building schedules would continue. So the idea of 
uh, students having a, a very structured schedule that they would be expected to log into and work across the day, that is something that would continue in a full distance environment if we had to transition into that. So we wouldn't just lose that schedule. The sequence of the schedule and the sequence of the curriculum uh, would continue uh, in the same way if we were full distance or if we came into uh, you know, something that was more of a hybrid blend. And then when we think about things like classroom meetings and the strategies that we're using to, to create connections and just synchronous supports, those are things that would also continue if we were pushed into a full distance mode as well. Uh, so again, I started with this discussion around these six elements. Uh, I, I intentionally did not get too far into schedules because that is next step of, of, of the work that's going to be taking place as Dr. Mingle uh, talked about, but we have a, a schedule for the way that our day is going to operate in terms of time. And then as principals do every year, they will actually define those by different grade levels and think about some of the building needs that they have to do in terms of student transitions and that type of thing. But the core of the work that, that will be taking place regarding instruction is really built around these six areas with this idea of, of embedded PD support and collaboration taking place. So again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to again, just share the overview. Uh, I know when we, when we, when we, begin to answer questions in certain areas, it's going to, it's going to really um, result in a whole series of other questions. And I said this to staff the other day that uh, we will continue to work hard to address the next level of questions that come from this overview. But I do want to thank all of the people that did uh, all of the work to get us to this point, because it has been uh, a lot of really hard work this summer. There's been some great work by teachers that are on committees right now, instructional coaches, uh, supervisors, uh, not to mention the tech department that works so um, quietly behind the scenes, but does just phenomenal work. I, I just think it's important that people realize that uh, that has been a tremendous amount of effort so, so far to get to this point, and we're going to continue to work just as hard as we move forward. So thank you again for the opportunity to share. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim, for this very thoughtful and comprehensive overview. And I also want to join you in thanking everybody that was involved in the creation of this plan. With that, I want to open it up for the board members to ask questions or start a discussion about what we have seen in this presentation. Please raise your hand or use the raise your hand feature. I see no board member. Mr. Franco, please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to echo what you just said. I think that Dr. Mingle and Mr. Kimmick have worked uh, tirelessly and their teams have worked tirelessly over the last several weeks to get us to a point where we have a plan to, um, to bring the kids back to school in the best way we know how. And so I just want to publicly acknowledge their efforts. Uh, I know that they've been working very hard and I think they've, they've done an exemplary job um, just getting to this point, obviously. Execution is going to be key, um, but I think the the planning stages they've worked they've worked uh, incredibly hard, and and I think they've been very diligent along the way. So I just wanted to publicly acknowledge that. Thank you very much, Mr. Franco. Mr. Breezy, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Bellman. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Kimmick, for that as well, and every all the work that went into that. Um, you touched a little bit on the, I guess the what the scenario where if we have to go back to a distance learning i was curious um if we yet know what the indicators are to allow the district to go from hybrid 1.0 to i guess the next phase for the original plan was hybrid 2.0 i know that's probably a little bit out of scope of the presentation you gave it was very focused on 1.0 which i think is right so um if not now then perhaps at the at the next meeting, maybe that, maybe that was planned, but I would be interested uh, to learn more about those. And I'll just jump in there. So we did, one of the things the Department of Health gave us at the end of last week is a, a color coded system. And it's, we're in a group of counties with, I believe, Hunterdon and Mercer. And the, and the Department of Health will publish every Thursday an update on where we are. We're currently in moderate risk, which means that we can open under these kinds of health and safety conditions. If it goes in one direction, if you get to very high risk, you have to close your facilities. If you get to low risk, you can open further. What, I, what they didn't give us, but I think it might be on their website, and I'll try to get it for the board, is all the different factors that lead them to determine. It has to do with 
county by county transmission rate, testing availability. So I'll, I'll see if I can find that for the board. Would, would you happen to know, um, I'm gonna ask you to speak for that commission, which I know. <laughs> would you happen to know if, that, if they plan on making that public on their website or is that information that would go straight to superintendents to get channeled that way? No, it's definitely on the website. There's actually already a sample on the website and I'll make sure you have the link. Excellent, thank you, that, that'd be very helpful. Thank you very much, Mr. Breezy and Dr. Mingo. Mrs. DiMaggio, was that a? Yes. Go ahead. Please go Thank ahead. you, Mr. Bellman. Thank you, Mr. Kimmick, um, for that. Um, can either you, Mr. Kimmick, or Dr. Mingle, I think we need to, especially for the, the younger children, the elementary ed, um, I think we need to stress to the parents that um, they should really have some you know, talks and chats with their kids at home, because even if you've chosen the hybrid, going back into school is going to look a lot different. And the teachers reactions and proximity to students are going to be a lot different. Um, and so maybe talk a little bit to that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, to start Dr. Mingle. Is that okay. So, so I think it's, it's important to realize and uh, I've said this in, in past presentations, but the, the in-school environment is going to be very different than it was in past years. I, I, I think uh, it's important that, that uh, adults understand that and that we begin to help students understand that as well. Because this idea of even, even when we think about like in a primary grade environment, typically teachers will hug kids when they see them, will put their arms around them, do things like that, reassure them in that way. Those are all going to be, you know, physical acts that are going to be very difficult or really impossible to do within this environment. Even the way rooms are set up, uh, you know, is something that is just going to be very, very different than what students, if they had been in school last year, not our kindergartners necessarily, but like our, our first graders, second graders, will look very different as well. We, we, you know, we can't have things like, we can't even have things like classroom rugs in the room right now. Uh, so in a typical primary grade classroom, a meeting space, a lot of times occurs at the rug. And it's something, again, that when you talk about culture and community building, that's where a lot of that would occur in a, in a primary grade classroom. So I think the strategies for doing that, you know, are something where we say, the reason we're saying it has to be across platforms is because the reality of the in-school environment is very different than it had been in past years as well. Um, it, it does get into the discussion around parent supports and how we can provide parent information around that. Uh, so that is something that is a focus of, of some summer work committees again to, to kind of create, you know, just just um, even even parent um, videos or just images of what the environment may look like in terms of how it's a little bit different. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim. Mrs. DiMaggio, please continue. Thank you. Um, just a follow up. And so can you then explain the difference of what's happening at the middle school with how it would look for kids who are in person on the hybrid versus let's say how it looked last year yeah. for and students. Th thank you for that question because I know I know these are things that people are wondering about too. I, at the middle school, the middle school is going to look a little bit more like an elementary school may look in terms of the way that students are organized. Uh, we're, you know, this is really hard I think for middle school kids in particular, especially because they're, they're, they look forward to these things at middle school like changing classes and using lockers and that's not what's going to take place this year. I, I, we're looking at actually having students, when they're in their homeroom pods, they will remain in their classroom and teachers will be the ones that are rotating to the room that the students are in. So students won't be kind of switching and reorganizing every period the way they would in a typical year. It is very much going to be that students are going to be remaining in their pods or their, 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 that section of the homeroom class that is in person and the teachers, the content area teachers will rotate to that room. Uh, so that's, that's a really big change for middle school. That's something I know that I, you know, I, have a, I have a ninth grader at home or one entering ninth grade at home. I understand that that is dramatically different, but that's really the way the guidelines are set up in terms of, of reducing uh, the mixing of students to, to just kind of uh, address the number of the guidelines that are set up in terms of, of uh, social distancing within the school environment. Uh, so Thank that's, you. That's a very different environment as well. Thank you for that question. Sure. Ms. DiMaggio and Mr. Kim. Um, I want to also provide a comment. The focus on building community and providing courts and distance learners opportunities, that will work 
that's a model that will serve all children and it really enforces unity and equity with all children, even those children that want to only be um, educated from home with a different level of risk tolerance. So really congratulations for coming up with this plan. Anybody else from the board? I see no further comment. With, with that, I'm moving on to the next agenda item. Um, committee reports. Is there anybody that has a committee report? Mr. Franco, please go ahead. Yeah, an hour before uh, the board uh, the board meeting commenced, we had a meeting of the curriculum, I'm sorry, of the personnel committee. Uh, a couple of things we discussed were the five-year job description plans, the uh, superintendent and board self-evaluation timelines, uh, and we spent some time talking about uh, planning for personnel given the requests that have come in for uh, accommodations due to the COVID related issues. Um, sounds like we have have a, a reasonable plan to, to keep moving forward with the staff we've, we've got and the, and the staff we're accommodating. So that was also good to hear. Thank you very much, Mr. Franco. Any other committee reports? Mrs. DiMaggio, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so this afternoon from four to five, the Curriculum Communications and Tech Committee, we met. Um, I am right now substituting in for Ms. Ayanna Taylor. She's our chair, um, and so she asked me to report out. Um, we spoke a lot about the interplay between um, our committee and then the ad hoc return to school committee. Um, and so now uh, we've transitioned to a place where we can take on more um, focus onto the curriculum and instruction um, since the ad hoc committee has done a lot of work and the logistics of getting everybody back in the hybrid AB is um, kind of set up. Uh, then we talked about um, kind of like Mr. Kimmick gave us a different uh, presentation than he gave to the public this evening. Um, and we, we did a lot of questions um, back and forth, very open dialogue. We learned a lot about um, the staffing models. Uh, ongoing work they're still um, doing, obviously, synchronous versus asynchronous, in-person versus at home, students. Um, and then we went into uh, grading responsibilities, especially um, when you talk about the team teaching now. Um, and then we got, we had an overview. Uh, the Mr. Kimmick came to us with instructional and assessment resource recommendations. Um, there's no board action um, here due to the cost of what was in um, the document that he shared with us. Uh, so we got to see um, the new features that are coming with, for example, like Google Enterprise, et cetera. Um, and then we talked a lot about um, the first days and return to school. Um, and hence, um, you know, my two questions in, in this larger public meeting that I thought were pretty important. Um, and then we uh, decided to, we moved our September meeting to September 14th at 5 p.m. And that was all for Curriculum, Communications, and Technology Committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Maggio. Mr. Breezy. Thank you, Mr. Bellman. The Finance, uh, Operations, and Security Committee met on Monday, August 10th at 6.30. Uh, a few topics we discussed. The first was changes to the School Employee Health Benefits Plan, also known as SEHBP. Um, there's a difference this year for participants. They will pay a percentage of salary instead of a percentage of the premium. Um, the, I guess the, the good news, the silver lining there is if the districts come out ahead, the savings right, go yeah. back to taxpayers. Um, however, no, no. Get your room. Go, get the I don't have my jammies on. Uh, however, the um, more to come on 812 because it is not yet known it wasn't known at the time of the meeting uh, what the information was so a little bit a little bit of a placeholder there uh, panic buttons uh, was another topic this two-step process um, one was to provide proof of compliance to the warren schools that has been submitted and completed 
and the other was the releasing of the grant funds from the state, which uh, is still to be determined. I do want to highlight the um, excellent work, uh, as always, by our buildings and grounds team, as well as by Mr. Uh, Ron Berry related to getting these up and running. My understanding is we know these work because I believe there was a slight alarm on one of them, which was a good test. So thank you for that. Uh, traffic beacons, we're still awaiting county action and final approval on this. Uh, we seem to be in a good position with this. This is for, I believe, all of the four elementary schools, if my memory is correct. Three elementary schools. Thank you, Mrs. Leonard. Um, and uh, Mrs. Leonard is in very close communications with um, the county on this. So as soon as we get further information, we will certainly pass that along. The middle school paving project was also a topic for us. Um, the estimated project cost for this ranged from a low of 1.3 million to a high of 1.6. Um, this is a capital item from a budget perspective, which led us into a, a, um, an always good discussion on the capital improvement plan and prioritizing items. Given some of the um, changes to this school year, the um, Finance Committee uh, asked administration that we bring this back up at a future meeting to, to revisit this plan. It is a, an evolving process that certainly takes input based on where the school is. So. There is that piece. Ultimately, um, the committee did recommend that the paving project move forward for bids in the fall with a with um, hopefully a potentially anticipated um, date for um, execution in the summer of 2021. And the last item was the um, the roof at our buildings and grounds uh, facility. Um, there was a memo with uh, probably more details on roofs than I can ever provide. Um, it, we, the committee discussed it, uh, I would say, in depth uh, as best we could. And the committee supported moving forward with a pitched metal roof on this facility that will include a 50 year um, warranty. Uh, the other option was a flat roof, which we believe would be a 20 to 30 year warranty. Um, the next committee meeting is scheduled for September 14th at 6.30 p.m. That is all, Mr. Bellman. Thank you very much, Mr. Breezy, for this detailed overview. Um, last committee, the return to school. Dr. Mingo? Thank you, Mr. Bellman. So um, we talked about some of what you already heard from Mr. Kimmick. We also reviewed several items that are on the agenda tonight, including some adjustments to transportation monitor hours and the school start and end times, which are on for approval. We, had, we talked about some future board actions around the need to uh, make sure we have substitute nurses available to cover and more action will come on that in the future. And then we talked about several odds and ends, including the August food day survey, which is uh, closed just a few hours ago. The <clears throat> legal guidance regarding submission of our final plan, um, leave requests, the various specific items that you've heard referenced throughout the night. And we also had an initial discussion about future board meeting locations, which I think will be a topic in new business as well tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Nino. Moving on to agenda item 11, public comment. We ask you to be brief and respectful with your comments and appreciate that among many voices, there will be areas of agreement and disagreement among reasonable people. But in this time, that is so stressful for our children and us all. We need to practice and model good listening and kindness the skills we so value our own teachers for. I remind you that board policy allows for public commentary for three minutes per participant and for 15 minutes in length. At such time, the board must then authorize an additional increment of 15 minutes or other increment as per our policy. All speakers have to provide their name and address before starting the comment. Please use the raise your hand feature that um, we are offered by Zoom you can click at the participants link at the bottom that will open up the participants list and there is a raise your hand option. Please click that and you are entered in the list of participants. With that, I want to start it with a user called VDEF. Please unmute yourself, turn on the camera. We also turn on the camera because we have some hearing impaired users on this call. Hi, Vidu Dev, Seven Nicole Lane, Warren. Um, hi, Dr. Bellman, and uh, thank you very much uh, to everyone for all of the informational updates. Very helpful. I had a, uh, two things that I wanted to ask. One was, if you're able to share the percentage of people that opted for hybrid versus distance learning, 
so that um, that would just be informative. And secondly, if you chose the hybrid model and your child starts school and they simply can't wear the mask for the period that's required, how quickly will you allow us to switch to the virtual model? And I think that comes with the spirit of we're all trying to get the younger ones to wear a mask for longer. But as Dr. Mengel has also said, that's difficult for us as adults to even do for several hours. So um, it would be helpful to just understand, I know you have the 30 day policy that's already been broadcasted to us, but I think those of, there's a lot of anxiety around this because we're just not sure if the younger kids can actually abide by that. And we certainly don't wanna create increased risk if they can't. So will you provide more flexibility to move back to the virtual distancing model if we see that within our children, that they're just unable to be compliant with the mask requirement while in school? Thank you very much. Those were two great questions. Um, thank you also for raising two questions. What I forgot to mention is that at the end of the public comment, um, administration will provide answers to um, some of these questions. And I really look forward to these answers as well. Moving on, we have um, the next participant, Laura Keller, please. Hi, uh, Laura Keller, 27 Skyline Drive. Uh, so a couple of the things that I heard uh, tonight that I think are, are really great improvements over the spring were the professional development approach and the addressing some of the inconsistencies across uh, teachers. I, I thought that was something I saw last year where across within a grade, across grades, across schools, um, there was a lot of uh, differences in how um, comfortable teachers were in their using synchronous video, asynchronous video, the collection of assignments, um, the giving feedback of assignments. So I think that is, is a really great um, uh, sort of uh, change that you guys seem to be including in this approach for the next year. Um, I also think the structured day and having the, the pods be aligned is also uh, a positive change. So in my house, um, it was a bit of a free for all after that first 15 minutes of meeting um, where you know it was up to my husband and I to stay on top of my daughter and keeping her on track. So it was up to us to decipher everything and figure, work through the assignments. Um, but to that end, can, can you give a sense of what um, kind of a day in the life would look like for remote learning uh, for the parents? So we talked a lot about the students and we talked a lot about the teachers, which are obviously very important. Um, but if you could give a sense of your expectations of the role of the parent in this uh, overall structure, I think that would help. Um, for, for us personally, you know, the openness of that schedule last year uh, for me and my husband made it easier for us to do our work because we could kind of work around what my daughter was doing. Um, on the other hand, the lack of the structure and the lack of the synchronous teachings and made it so that a lot of the burden of, of her learning fell on us. Um, so if you could give a sense, and, and I know it's very different between um, age groups and how different kids are gonna be more autonomous and less autonomous and every parent has different circumstances at home. But if you could give um, parents an understanding of, of the role that you're expecting them to play in this overall model, I think that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Keller. Moving on to the next participant, Nicole Gamero. Uh, hi, Nicole Gamero, 234 King George Road. Um, just want to start by saying thank you everyone for all your hard work. And uh, my first question echoes uh, the first person that spoke in relation to swapping and switching and what that, what that looks like. Um, I know for our family, we were leaning towards virtual and upon participating in the board meetings and hearing Dr. Mingle um, encourage us if we weren't sure and we were waiting for more details to just stick with the hybrid um, and figure out what the details were going to be. Um, and I know there's still a lot of questions about that and still a lot of questions there. And so now I kind of feel like I'm um, not sure if we're stuck with hybrid now when that wasn't necessarily our intention. And so I know once we start school, there may in fact be this 30 day, but at this point in time before school begins, if we are still feeling strongly like maybe virtual is the right choice, do we have the ability to swap? Um, and relatedly, if for families that do start with hybrid and end up 
whether it's 30 days or not switching to distance. I've been on the board meetings, I've been listening intently, and I'm still a little bit unclear as to if um, what the transition will be with the, the teachers um, between the, those folks that are switching if they choose to do so. Are they going to a different teacher? Is that where the co-teaching comes into play? A little bit more clarification of that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gamero, for that great question. Moving on to Deborah Pincus. I think you have to unmute yourself, please. You're I'm sorry. Um, how are you? I, I had a question. I'm actually an elementary school teacher. Please and it's start with the name and address. Thank I'm you sorry. So Deborah Pincus, 3 Birchmont Lane in Warren. Um, and I am actually an elementary teacher in a district in Union County. And we were just announced on Friday at 10 o'clock at night that we found out that we were going totally virtual. And we were told it had to do with the ventilation system um, in the schools. So I was just wondering, I know they have to, different schools have different things, but I was wondering what we've done to upgrade the ventilation system, um, the HVAC system and, you know, what changes, you know, I was, from what I can understand, what was acceptable during a non pack um, when we weren't having a pandemic, it was perfectly fine. But now that we're in a p pandemic, um, I think some, I, what I was told was some information came out from the state possibly that caused, but, you know, caused my district to change their mind. And I, you know, I've seen a, quite a few districts have changed their minds in the last few weeks and not few weeks, but in like the last week. So I was wondering where we are with ventilation and mm -hmm. are there rooms? I also wanted to know if there were rooms without, um, windows. I'm not really aware, but I know some schools have rooms without windows and that would be really not a good situation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Pinkos. Moving on to uh, Rachel Singleton. Yep. Rachel Singleton, 22 Deer with Trail West. Um, my, my question relates to um, the special ed uh, children. Um, if you're in an Oh, you can't hear me. Oh, okay. Um, if the if the special ed IEP kids are in an ICR classroom, um, will the special ed teacher be in that room? And if they have to be pulled out to the resource room, will the child move to the resource room, or will that teacher move um, to the classroom to uh, give the child the uh, specialized instruction that they need? That's what I wanted to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving on to Gretchen Minieri. Okay, uh, I have a couple questions. If um, we go to uh, distance learning, state your name. Uh, what would be uh, if there would be any consideration to maybe putting teachers still in the classroom, sort of for the kids to have that visual and to keep continuity. I know that some school districts that are going to full distance have decided to do that, keep the teachers in the classroom with no students, if that would possibly be a consideration. Um, what those numbers would have to be um, for illnesses uh, for us to stop school, if there, what those plans are, how the, if that looks per school and if it's different, if it happens in one school versus the district or if it's just in the town and not in the schools. And I guess if there's any response plan for any sort of actions by the NJEA as far as a strike or a sick out, what maybe our plans are or contingency plans based on that. That's all. And can you please state your address for the protocol? Ms. Minieri, can you please state your address for the protocol? Moving on. Um, that was the last participant. Anybody else, please raise your hand. Jokey. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Jokey from Nine Heritage Drive, Warren. Um, and I'm just trying to see if I understood properly the current proposed plan um, with my concern being the younger children um, that the ones that are still, you know, developing and learning to read and write. And in this hybrid model, 
in school, is there actually going to be in-person teaching taking place by the teacher? Or is it almost like they're doing distance remote learning in the classroom setting while their classmates are doing the same thing alongside them at home? Um, because I guess my question is, is if that, if they're doing an in-person somewhat remote curriculum, then what are they gaining from being in person in school from the teacher student perspective, as opposed to the student student perspective? That, that's my question. Thank you very much, Mrs. Choki. Um, Nicole Romero, there is a, a problem on the agenda. It states that every user can only ask one question until everybody has spoken. I think you were already, so I'm moving on to Linda Draper. Hi, uh, Linda Draper, 78 Briarwood Drive East. Um, I had two questions, but one was already asked. It was um, how many children opted for the hybrid, which I know has already been asked. And also I want to know how many teachers opted in as well. Um, to come back to the classroom rather than just teach uh, remotely. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next one is Catherine Health Abel. Hi, Catherine Health, um, 228 Mount Horeb Road, Warren. Um, I just have one question. My question is, Heather, I, I came on late, so I don't know if this has been answered already. But my question is, are there any adjustments that have been made to the attendance policy? Um, I know that it's been pretty lax um, given the circumstances, you know, with remote, but when we go back to virtual, I know that um, it is something that needs to be accounted for. And I was wondering if there's going to be any actual policy change to attendance um, because if children are encouraged to stay home, if they are sick, um, we don't want truant officers knocking on our door potentially, which I don't think will happen, but it's nice to have that in black and white. So that was my that was my main question. That's it. Thank you very much. Otherwise, there is no comment. Oh, there is a second comment from one user that we can use if nobody else um, has spoken or wants to speak. VDev, please go ahead. Hi, thanks. Just one comment, and it's a bit of a question as well. For parents that are both working parents, um, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to have the burden of the teaching responsibility on us. And a lot of us do are working for organizations where they're asking us to now come back, whereas a lot of us have been virtual. We're being asked to come back to our organizations and start work um, physically and in person. So I guess my, my request and my humble request is whatever you're able to do to proactively equip us as parents with the educational curriculum materials. I know that there is a strong um, thinking within the district that you wanna do everything in real time, but we also have to understand the reality, which is there is a bit of a transfer of educational responsibility coming to parents that we did not have at this level before. And in order for us to really help our children succeed, we do need a little bit more visibility in advance of some of that material. So if you're able to provide it in any which way or form, I think it would be immensely helpful, especially when both parents are working and you're really trying to figure out how you're gonna sort out and give your kids the best education. And it's um, you know difficult to have the younger ones fully engaged for several hours on a virtual kind of tool. I know this is the best we can do, and I know all of you have done a phenomenal job this summer working long hours to figure this out for us, but just the voice of the working parents where you have two of us trying to figure it out, it's really tough. And um, if you're not familiar with the curriculums, um, it makes it even more stressful for us, and that unfortunately gets displaced back to the child. So if there's anything you could do to help us be more proactive about the curriculum, that would be quite helpful to us. So that's just a humble request to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, last, Catherine Held-Abel with a second 
comment? I, I'm sorry. I just wanted to piggyback on that um, after she had spoke. I, again, Catherine, Ebel, uh, Catherine Hill, Abel 228, Mount Horeb Road, Warren. Um, that actually brings me to a secondary point, but I, I actually have flexibility during the day. We are not, um, I'm not working during the day and I do have a lot of flexibility. However, I have five children. Um, two of them are older, one's in the middle school and um, two are in the elementary school level. Um, my two youngest are only a grade apart. And I will say that even if you don't have a working parent um, that is out of the house or needing to, um, you know, juggle, juggle a schedule like that, even for someone that does have more flexibility, it's, it's almost impossible to have a, I had a kindergartner and a first grader this year, to have them doing this um, in real time is impossible. You know, um, having that flexibility is very helpful. So I, do, I think it's a little bit unreasonable to think that we're able to bounce back and forth. I mean, I was literally bouncing back and forth between the two kids because children that are that small don't have um, great skills with technology. So you're basically doing everything for them on that front. Um, the other thing that I also wanted to bring up that kind of pairs along with what she was saying was um, we also have to kind of take into account, I know that you guys don't typically take requests from parents in terms of scheduling or I'm um, obviously it wouldn't matter classroom wise, but I mean, we're talking completely different days um, versus versus, you know, it's kind of like the kids are in two different schools almost. Um, when we have, you know, neighbors and close friends that we depend on that are in the district, if we don't have that, you know, um, if we don't have that neighborhood that we can rely on or, you know, our close network of friends, because some of us are in the beginning of the alphabet and others are at the end of the alphabet, it makes it a lot more difficult for us. So I think that that's something that should be a little bit more lenient this year if possible. Um, I don't know if you might be able to answer to that if you're able to make any sort of accommodations based off of people and their extenuating work circumstances and things like that. Um, but that was the only other comment that I had. You know, I think that the, the more flexible everyone is with this, it's easier for everyone. Um, obviously, some people do want their kids in real time watching the teacher. For, for me, and just the nature of my household and just having so many children that need to be on at the same time, it just doesn't work for, for a house that has multiple kids that need to be logging on at the exact same time because they need how you know, for the younger ones that don't understand how to navigate from one tab to another, even it's, it's just very difficult and it's not able to be accomplished um, without literally standing over them for the entire time that they're in school. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We are at the end of the first 15 minute block and there are three more people that want to speak. I'm Mr. Breezy. Uh, make a motion to extend public commentary for another 15 minutes. Second, Mrs. Zahn. I think we'll just do a voice call. Board members only. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Objections? Abstentions? It's now extended. Thank you. Eight o'clock, nine minutes. We have user um, Shefali, please. Hi, uh, Shefali Tajani, one Aspen Court. Um, my son is starting kindergarten at, at ALT and he will be doing hybrid, but the days that, that he's remote, it's, you know, it's about, you know, if you, if you don't include the, um, the, the last 50 minutes of transition, it's about three and a half hours in front of the iPad doing work. So for a five, six year old kid, that can be very difficult to sit in front of a screen for that long and to focus and, and pay attention. So how is that going to be handled? And if a child just cannot do that, how will that be handled, especially if these assignments are mandatory? Um, and then secondly, the specials period, which whether you're remote or, or hybrid is going to be done at home. Are those, is that a mandatory special or is that optional? Um, and how much parental involvement will that particular special require? That's it. Thank you very much. Next is Todd Jokey. Hello, Todd Jokey, Nine Heritage Drive. Um, my main question that I have pertains to when the students are actually in the class. 
Um, it's mentioned that there may be times when they, when the teachers are on with the other cohort. Um, my question is, is how much are the kids going to get the teachers undivided time while they're in the classroom? I mean, with such limited amount of time that they have to begin with, um, the last thing I want is the teacher to be fussing around trying to uh, get on with all the other students, make sure all the other students are online. Um, that's, that's, that's my main question. I, just, I want to make sure that their time is, is undivided while in the classroom. And similar to the last speaker, um, you know, I have a daughter who was in kindergarten last year going into first. Um, I'd like to see a reduction in the amount of computer time and as much um, paperwork, writing, reading as possible. I mean, uh, the, the computer aspect uh, made it extremely difficult, especially when I had an older son and more of my time I felt like was with him. So with my daughter um, was, was mainly just YouTube videos and, and down that YouTube video rabbit hole. Um, so I'd like to see try a, a, minim, a minimization of that um, uh, those the, the computer aspect and more paper. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next we have Rosa Krause. Rosa Krause to Holly Drive. Um, so my first question is, has our, have our, has our plan actually been approved by the state? Or um, I, it was my understanding that every a back to school plan has to be approved by the state. And then my other question, and I don't know if I missed that because I missed the, last, the first couple of minutes. Um, when did you provide teachers with the additional uh, development of remote learning? And what type of supplies are you going to send home for everyone uh, to have equitable learning at home in regards to math books and um, other materials? And then my last question is for children that are on an IEP. Um, so how is that going to work? Um, the day or the days that they're going to be in school is that where they're going to get most of their in-class support or um, how, I'm just trying to really because I really haven't gotten a clear guidance on that um, on how how the IEPs are going to work um, that's all that was, those are my questions thank you very much seeing so no more comments Dr. Mingel, do you need two, three minutes to compile the list of questions or can you start with some of the answers? No, I think I can jump right in. I, I, I highlighted as I was taking notes, I think I can address at least briefly, I think everything that came up. Um, so if I get lost along the way, you know, we have a second public commentary area or uh, certainly we can follow up with individuals as we need to. Uh, there was a question about what percentage opted for hybrid distance. Well, this was in our presentation a couple weeks ago. The final number is somewhere around 18% full distance, which is quite low compared to other surrounding communities. Um, so about 82% hybrid, 18% full distance. That is a moving number, which goes to another question that was common of how, how quickly can we react to a parent request to change? We've been making changes every day since the deadline. So if the change is from hybrid to distance, we can respond to that in pretty much immediate real time. The sooner we know, the better. So all of the homeroom assignments and all the cohorting is being done to balance every classroom to have approximately the same amount of kids and all of that. So if suddenly next Wednesday, we got a huge change, that might lead to needing to move kids from one homeroom to another to accommodate or something like that, which none of us wants to do. So if there are people who know they wanna make a change, please contact the, the letter you get tomorrow will have exactly what to do next, uh, which is reaching out to the school principal. Again, moving from hybrid to distance is much easier than the other way around. There, it does say there's a 30 day notice. That's the minimum amount of time by state policy. That doesn't mean that we're not going to accommodate it sooner. We will accommodate it as soon as we can accommodate it. Um, let's see, uh, day in the, in the life for parents. So I think that's a good item for future follow-up. Our teacher teams that have been working on the resources for teachers that are going live to them this week also have as part of their task resources for parents, which will come next. I think uh, it actually came up in a meeting earlier today, giving a sense of what the day in the life of a student is going to look like, but I think the day in the life of a parent makes a lot of sense too, and that's something we can take back to work on. Uh, question of uh, transition of, from teacher to teacher. For example, if you go from hybrid to distance and vice versa, the, the, the staffing plan we were able to get to in the end 
allows us to guarantee that the teacher will not change if a student changes their model, meaning the same teachers are involved in the student's education, whether they are in person, in hybrid, or if they are in full distance. That allows that transition to be much smoother. There are additional teachers that will support that grade level. So there will be commonly uh, co-teaching models in place so that students, whether they're special education services or not, everybody will be used to having um, multiple teachers, but their core homeroom teacher of record will be the same whether they are in distance or at home. And that assignment will come out, our goal is next week, so that everybody has that information. Uh, there was a question about ventilation systems, and I know which district you're talking about from based on the 10 o'clock last Friday, because immediately after we started getting requests from teachers in that district, teachers of ours who live in that district who suddenly had childcare situations change. Um, our uh, buildings and grounds uh, staff has reviewed the state guidelines on ventilation systems. The guidelines that are in the state documents have to do with the percentage of fresh air that comes in through the system. We are able to accommodate that in all of our spaces. There are places, there are places in the district where there are not uh, windows, where there are internal spaces to the greatest extent possible. We can remove students from those settings, but even if we are in a setting like that, the ventilation systems meet the state requirements. Um, that is an area that is not my expertise, but we will be having a presentation at our next meeting that focuses on health safety and operational issues, and Mr. Pate, our buildings and ground supervisor, will be part of that, and we can go into it in more detail if there are questions. Uh, in school, is there actually going to be in-person teaching taking place, or is it almost like they're doing distance learning in the classroom even though they're in person? So the answer is, is both. So there will be times, even in person, where it'll feel like a distance learning setting because of the nature of what kids are working on and how important we think it is to build community between the students who are in the facility and the students who are out of the facility by working together in a small group. So traditionally, as Mr. Kimmick said in his presentation, there might be a mini lesson and then students might break into small groups to apply that or to work with a teacher. That will all still keep happening. However, the teacher can't get four kids around a small table in a closed setting like they normally do. So that might have to take place using technology, even if they're in person. At the same time, the teacher is teaching directly to the students in the class in front of her. Uh, that's not always the same time as this teaching going on at home. There's opportunities for both to take place in the schedule. So, you know, when you look at a window of say, 50 minutes for reading, there's only seven to 10 minutes of the direct instruction before students are applying. And then the teacher that can work with students who are in person or students who are at home, small groups, in person or technology. Now, there was a question about how many teachers opted in. I'm just gonna reframe that question. There was no opt in out, opt out process. Our teachers didn't have the option to select distance teaching as um, their model. Our teachers are expected to report back uh, to school facilities unless they have a documented medical condition for which an accommodation is required. Those numbers are still being uh, finalized because we have outstanding medical documentation going on this week. There will be some staff members granted accommodations as, as great as continuing to work from home. There are several leaves of absence on the agenda tonight, which reflect staff members who, for various reasons, cannot come back under this model right now and have been granted a leave of absence based on the guidelines from either the state or federal governments, depending on which kind of a leave it is. Um, there was a question, oh, po uh, attendance policy adjustments. One of the big changes from the state level from the spring to the fall is in the spring we were told, when students are not in facilities, you just count them as present. They don't have to do anything to earn that credit as being present, that was the state guidelines. That has changed, so now there is an expectation that students are engaging, they are signing in, they are participating in their learning throughout the day to count as present. At the same time, we are not, even in our normal circumstances, there are not truant officers showing up at homes in Warren. We work with, with our school counselors, our child study team members, if that's appropriate, our building administrators to work with the family to solve whatever problems come in. And this kind of crosses a couple of questions. Um, one of the biggest things we heard in the spring was a desire for there to be more synchronous, real-time interaction and learning between students and their peers and between students and their teachers. And so that was one of the primary things we solved for in this model. But we recognize that for a percentage of families, that's going to be extremely challenging. One of the advantages of the new Google system that Mr. Kimmick referenced is it will allow our teachers to record those experiences so that families who can't access it in real time, maybe based on a childcare situation, will have access at their own time. So while there is a new attendance requirement, 
there's also the opportunity for us to be flexible to different circumstances. What I would recommend to all the parents on the call is, as you get into the first week or two and, you start, and, and things get to a routine, and it'll take at least the first two weeks for us to figure out that routine, if you're struggling or if your, your child is struggling, definitely reach out to the teacher so that they can work on a plan, we can respond and, and accordingly. It'll, it won't be the same for any two students. And obviously there are differences by age and everything else, but um, one of the great advantages we have now that we didn't have in the spring is that our facilities are open. So for example, the questions about what paper-based materials would be available. We can, we can supply all of that now and we can teach our students regularly, even in the hybrid, how to be prepared for their responsibilities at home. Where in the spring with no notice, we had to completely re uh, redo the environment. So there, there will be paper-based materials. There is no expectation that that entire block of time where students are home is on a computer. There will definitely be paper-based application, um, much more so at the earlier grades than the later grades. That was one of the big problems with us not being able to, we weren't even allowed to open our facilities for our staff. Now we can get those things to families. In fact, you're gonna hear soon um, about plans for how we get materials out to families who are in full distance learning or in hybrid B who won't be in person on the very first day of school. Um, and again, nothing works the same way for different families. So there are some families who will want it to be 100% synchronous real time. There will be some families that want it to be asynchronous. You know, we do the best we can to try to accommodate uh, uh, the different needs in the community. There was a question about requests from parents regarding cohorts. It will not be possible for us to respond to every parent request regarding a cohort. So in the letter that goes home tomorrow, there'll be information about that. If there is an extreme extenuating circumstance, um, we've heard from many families already about those and they were taken into consideration where possible, but that would be something to reach out to the building principal about. Uh, that's not about a personal preference, but that about an extreme extenuating circumstance and the principals will be the people that will assist with that. Um, specials, is it mandatory in the afternoon? How much parental involvement? Those specials will be delivered by certified teachers, just like if they were during the school day. So um, of course, depending on the student, there's more or less parent involvement, but there will be a teacher you know, assigned to delivering that instruction during that block of time. Is it mandatory? I would say it's as mandatory as anything else. There's only so much power we have to force somebody to engage in any kind of a learning experience, but you know, these specials are part of our academic program and an important part of the student experience. Are the kids going to get uh, undivided time while in the classroom? The kid, so not necessarily completely. There, the teachers have responsibilities. This is one of the big challenges of operating this kind of learning environment is this, the teachers have responsibilities to all the students in the room. They also have responsibilities to students who are learning at home and they have support to help them make all that happen both in person and at home. That doesn't mean that the, the students aren't getting priority attention. Students don't get 100% of the teacher's attention all the time, even in a traditional classroom setting. There's a lot of independent time. So I understand that concern. I, can, I, I hear that concern. Uh, that's one of the things that we have to work through and figure out what works best in each setting with different ages of students as well. Has our plan been approved? Yes, our plan has been approved by this, the New Jersey Department of Education. The way that's done is through the County Office of Education, and we do have that approval. Um, teachers additional professional development, as I'm sure you know, and I think we talked about maybe at the last meeting, our teachers are 10 month employees. They are not paid for their time in July and August. So right now we have a team of teachers being paid to work to develop the materials for staff. They will be available by the end of this week, early next week for people that want to get a head start. But that's why we push the start of school back by a week so that we have contractual time to make sure our teachers have all the support. But I can say that the vast majority of our teachers have been working throughout the summer to prepare themselves to be reviewing materials and to be ready to go for the opening of the school year. Um, there were some special education questions. Give me one second, let me swap back up here. About, um, you know, will a student be receiving special education services in their classroom, going to another place? Um, will it be on the days when they're in person or the days when they're at home? And the answer to all of those questions is yes, all of those things will happen. So it depends on the nature of the classroom and the student and the services. But if a student's IEP says that he or she gets uh, paraprofessional support or in-class resources, that will be true whether they are in person or at home, in hybrid or full distance. There will be somebody responsible for that. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will have somebody you know, on a call with them at all times 
it means that they will have the special education resources to provide the accommodations and modifications as their IEP requires. Whether they go out to a separate setting for certain subject areas very much depends on that specific school and its situation. If there's normally a case, for example, where um, two or three students come from different homerooms and come together with one teacher, if they're still in different homerooms right now, they can't cross cohorts to go into a small group with, a, with an ASAP teacher for basic skills or an English language, an ESL teacher for English language learning or special education. So those services would have to be developed and delivered using technology because of the requirements for health and safety. But that all quite, it's quite dependent on the individual circumstance. But I just want to reiterate that any IEP requirements, 504 plans, English language learners, basic skills, those services are provided regardless of the model, but they might look a little bit different in one place or another. Um, but that's something that we address on an individual basis as we get into the school year. Um, what types of supplies will you send home? So that's again, another benefit of us having facilities open is we'll be able to get home things like math workbooks, reading materials and so on for all students, even our full distance learning students. And I, I think at least at a basic level, I've addressed everything, but again, I, I'm happy to follow up on the FAQ with other questions down the road. Thank you very much, Dr. Mingle, for these answers to these questions. And we will have another section of public comment at the end um, of the agenda. If there is any question unanswered, but that was very elaborate. Thank you so much. Moving on in our agenda to agenda item 12. Mrs. Soon, could you please? Oh, sorry. First, any board member, do you want to pull out any of these items for special um, vote or for discussion? I see no motion to pull any agenda item out for special discussion or special vote. Mrs. Soon, could you please? Yes, thank you. Motion to approve items for board consideration, section 12A, one through six, B, one through three, C, one through seven, and D1. Sarah DiMaggio. Thank you. Mr. Bellish. Yes. Mr. Bishi. Yes. Mr. Brzee. Yes. Mrs. Chu. Yes. Mrs. DiMaggio. Yes. Mr. Franco. Yes. Mrs. Zahn. Yes. Mr. Bellman. Yes. Motions carry. Thank you very much. Agenda item 13, unfinished business. Mr. Bellman. Yes. Sorry, there's one that I definitely missed. Can I address that real quick? So Yes, please go ahead. To save somebody from re-asking it because I forgot to address it, I want to get to it. So this, there was a question about how will uh, we make decisions, like when will we know we have to go to distance learning? Uh, let me make sure I get the full question here. Um, one second. So um, how will we make a decision if there's like an outbreak of some kind, that sort of thing, and, and make decisions about going out? So in the New Jersey Department of Health guidelines that came out at the end of last week, they do give scenario situations. Um, we met with our health officials today. Basically what we were told by our health officials is every single school and school situation will be handled as, a, as an individual case by case decision where the health officials will tell us what they recommend. But the guide that's in the Department of Health recommendations does not get to even the idea of considering closing a school until there are multiple cases in a school that are linked to each other and not to another source, meaning it seems that the transmission happened in school. So if there's one confirmed case, schools stay open. The students in close contact with that case are isolated and go into at-home learning, but not anybody beyond that. If there are two or more cases in the same classroom, again, school stays open, we handle those cases, close contact being within six feet for more than 10 minutes. One of the reasons our plan was approved is because we can make sure that we're maintaining that distance in all of our settings. So again, it's not until we get into multiple cases in the same place where they, it's not that they got it at some out of school place, but there was some transmission in the school. Uh, the other part of that question was about if there's a staffing action of some kind, you know, not being able to staff our schools regardless of COVID-19 would be a reason why we would have to not open the schools. Uh, I don't anticipate that being an issue. Uh, we've worked really hard to make sure that we take into consideration all the cons uh, concerns and um, you know, accommodation requests and that sort of thing of staff, but 
uh, and we're developing plans for how our substitute system will work and all of that, but uh, it seems much more likely that individual students or very small groups of students would have to isolate and continue learning from home than large groups of students uh, as long as everybody follows the protocols, uh, which goes back to the question of, you know, if we try this and our student can't handle the mask, for example, can we move out into full distance? And the answer remains yes. But I would say, uh, you've probably all seen the videos about helping, and I hate this term, but it's what people are using, mask training. Uh, we need to start practicing. So if our kids aren't used to it, which I'm sure most of them aren't for extended periods of time, now is the time over the next three weeks to gradually work that up to a little bit longer and longer time. Thank you, Mr. Bowman. Very much, Dr. Mingo, for addressing this as well. Moving on to unfinished business, I'm not aware of any, any board member that has an item for unfinished business. It seems not. New business, I am aware of two um, new business items that want to be brought up. Mr. Brzee, could you please bring up one? Sure, yeah. thank you, Mr. Bellman. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, so the topic I wanted to discuss uh, in new business was the, I guess, the future locations for board meetings. Uh, we had discussed this, I think Dr. Mingo referred to it briefly in his ad hoc return to school committee update. Uh, we, we discussed this a little bit there with the board members that were present there. Uh, I felt that, um, you know, I, I felt that it would be worthwhile getting, you know, all, all nine members input uh, into this. Um, I think, you know, my personal opinion is if we have employees who are going back and I think the word was employees do not have a choice, not all of them do. Uh, we as a board should be setting the standard and setting the same, living up to the same standards that uh, our employees uh, are, are under. So um, I, maybe I'm the min minority, I don't know. I just wanted to bring it up for, I guess, general board discussion for further uh, dialogue and consideration. So thank you, Mr. Bowen. Thank you very much. Mrs. Sohn, is that an answer or a discussion item for this topic? Yeah. It's on this topic, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I take note of the point that the teachers and the students are going back into the buildings, but even now we're not opening them up to visitors. And a board meeting needs to be a public event. We need to be open to the public. And um, we are benefiting the last, this is the third board meeting in a row that we've had in a row that we've had over 200 participants or 200 people attend. And I do not see how we could accommodate that level of interest from the public if we were in person. Um, so that's my hesitation is, is a safety concern. Um, I would want us to in no way limit access and I don't know how to provide access under the current environment. Mr. Preezy, please go ahead. Go ahead. I completely agree with Mrs. Zahn on that. In, in the, the, my intent was by no means to, um, to limit public participation. I think the participation has been excellent with the Zoom meetings. Maybe there's, let's call it hybrid 1.0. Maybe there's an option where you can do both, right? Our students are doing it. We should be able to do it as well. I mean, there's nine of us. That, that's just, my, it's kind of, you know, in my industry, we call it eating our own dog food. That's just, if, if it's good enough for them, it should be good enough for us. That's, um, it, Mrs. Zahn's point is extremely valid, though. I appreciate that so, and certainly agree with her. Right now, um, there's a limited amount of people that are able to come together with the current law in New Jersey. That's 25 with the um, reproduction factor over one. I don't think that this will be changed for more. So we would never be able to hold a meeting like this. 200 people participation. This is great. Parents care about uh, what's going on in the fall. There's also um, quarantine requirements. Some states require you to quarantine before you go into that state, or New Jersey requires you to quarantine if you come from a state. I definitely do not want to exclude anybody, so that's why I think we should continue as we have, have purely an online presence because that allows everybody to um, participate. And it seems that it is going very well considering how we operated before, how we operate right now. Mr. Bellish. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I was just gonna, gonna comment as well that I think, um, you know, regardless of whether or not the board meets, you know, in person um, or not, I think it's important for the public to have a, a forum to be able to participate and ask questions um, through a virtual uh, platform. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Embellish. I see a motion from uh, Ms. DiMaggio. Hi, thank you. So um, earlier this past week, I actually wrote to um, Dr. Mingo. I said, you know, I, I do feel a bit hypocritical. We're asking students and um, staff to go back. Um, and I think we should lead. I mean, we, we elect him, our leader, and so we should lead by example. Um, I'm all for it, um, wearing masks, et cetera, whatever we have to do. Um, and I understand, absolutely, Mrs. Zahn, of course, logic and reason and logistics. Um, however, perhaps just the board, the nine of us could be there, and it could be then virtual as well. Um, I just think it would speak, it speaks volumes that, you know, we're going to sit here in our homes and tell parents and, and our staff, but it's okay for you all to go in and send your kids in. Um, I just felt very, very personally, ethically, a bit hypocritical. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Beachy, please go ahead. Uh, just two, two thoughts that came up as we're talking about it. I will be traveling. So I guess I do have to look into the laws, but I guess I would have to quarantine. So if we do if we do it in person, I would have to uh, dial and not traveling, I'm not taking planes or anything, but I am traveling out of state. So we would have to have a dual meeting, I guess, if I was to, if my presence was necessary, I would have to dial in for those meetings that were within the two weeks. And, um, and I think the parents have a choice to send their children in, right? So I don't know that we're making <laughs> parents send their kids in. They do have the choice to do it remotely. Although Mr. Breezy and Ms. DiMaggio, I, I take your point about leading by example, but um, I, I, I kind of tend to think as Ms. Zahn said, I'm not sure if we're accomplishing anything by getting together in person and, and creating a, a greater number of people in the same room. Uh, it just, it seems riskier to me factually to get together in person at this point. That's all. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Bishi. Mrs. Chu. Yeah, I, I tend to, I mean, I would be happy to go in and wear a mask and do what's necessary if that means just to show that we would do that. But really, it's not really accomplishing much. I mean, if the nine of us get together, I don't, I don't know, uh, in person, I don't know what that really does. Um, and then there's nine of us plus Dr. Mingle, um, Miss Lionheart, like that's 11. So you have how many other people that can show up in person? Not, not many. So like in theory, it sounds nice to, you know, get, get back together and not hypocritical, but again, echoing what others have said, it doesn't, I don't know if we're really accomplishing anything. And we are, we are volunteers, we are not employees. So right now we are not allowing the PTO to come in and uh, volunteer in schools. We would require additional cleaning after we have been in, um, causing additional cost, um, sanitation. The room has to be cleaned um, now professionally. And once again, what does it achieve? What benefit does it bring just to make a point that nine people plus two sit in an extra room? I think the efficiency is um, given on Zoom for this bot to operate. Um, Mr. Bellish, was that a hand? Or is it still up? Sorry, I, I didn't put my hand down from okay. earlier. Uh, I'll do that now. Mr. Breezy, please go ahead. Yeah, no, all good points, and and certainly this was the reason why I wanted to get the you know the input from, from 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 the entire board, um, and not just a subset. So I I certainly appreciate uh, everyone's input. I think it's extremely valuable. Um, you know, I'll just reiterate. Maybe there's an option for hybrid, if I, and I understand there's there's travel um, requirements that each of us have for for work or personal or vacations or whatever it is, which could which could limit that. So. Completely respect that. I'm just, um, I, I think Mrs. DiMaggio's words of hypocritical, I, 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 it does feel a bit hypocritical telling our em employees of our board, the board that we are, that you are going back to work, but we are, we will be here in my home if you need me. So 
Thank you. I appreciate the discussion, though. Thank you very much. I see still a motion from Mr. Franco. Yeah, I agree with 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 Mr. Brzee on this. I mean, we are we are asking our staff uh, to come back to the buildings, and you know, and we're saying it's safe. We're doing taking the precautions to make it safe for them, and so I think you know, by example, we should be doing the same. Uh, I'm happy to come back to the to in person, and and as I said during the ad hoc meeting. You know, we could do a hybrid model where there's some people remote and some people in the in the room. It was good enough for the United States Congress. Should be okay for us. Um, and then if people want to come, we can allow as many people is that is that is allowed for the guidelines in the building. And then the rest of the people would have to be virtual. But I think I'm, I'm I would be for returning to in-person board meetings. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Dr. Neal? I just wanted to share that um, from a practical standpoint that we should land at least on the next meeting um, because we will have to advertise a location change um, depending on what is going on. I don't know, Mrs. Lenhart, can you share what it's advertised as now for the 31st? I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that. No problem. The entire year, of course, was advertised as in person. So right. for each virtual, I throw an ad in the paper. Thank you. So we're, we're waiting on additional guidance to answer some of the unanswered questions about how you can do a hybrid and make sure that everything is buttoned up. Um, I don't know that I can promise us having that in place for two weeks from tonight. Um, so it, we might want to think about the meeting two weeks from now one way and then work on what the plan will be going forward once the school year starts. I see first Ms. DiMaggio and then Mr. Franco. Hi, thank you. I just wonder, does anybody have an idea about Ms. Taylor, how she felt about this in ad hoc? Well, I think it's best if we let Ms. Taylor speak for herself. True. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Franco? Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know that we're going to resolve this for the next meeting, but we should at least, uh, to Dr. Mingle's point, we should know what's permissible. We should have those answers so we can make a decision. Right, right now we have, we're not exactly sure what we're allowed to do. And I think we just need to know that before we, before we take this further. Mr. Bellis. So it, does there Sorry. need to be a motion? Does there, does there need to be a motion made to, to, to in, instruct Dr. Mingle to figure this out or, or is he just gonna, are you just gonna take it? I mean, I'll only share where we are and then you can decide if that's, the right path. So, um, you know, I shared some with the with the board. The, if, I think Mrs. Lenhart, correct me if I say this incorrectly, but the guidance from New Jersey School Boards Association is to check with your your school board attorney. So, what we would do next is ask our attorney for an opinion. As long as that's whatever you know, I don't know that we need a motion to do that. We can just do that. If people feel there's something else we should do, then maybe there should be a motion. But that would be our next step: is to ask. Um, Matt G for his guidance. Thank you. And I saw uh, Mr. Bellish raising his hand. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, I was just going to say um, we should we should start working through um, any logistical challenges associated with a with a hybrid. I don't know how productive it would be, you know, for each board member and administration to have their own devices. I'm sure there's issues with with feedback. So uh, I'm sure those logistical um, you know work that needs to probably be sorted through as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Ms. Chu, please go ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm a little unclear. So if nothing, we don't act now, does that mean the next meeting is in person? No, I would say it would be just like this if we didn't do anything else. Okay. But that's up to the board. So if, I, if I'm misunderstanding, please definitely redirect. Well, it sounds like we would lose a lot of people because only 14 people in the public could join under current law if we had it live and so I would I would I guess vote <laughs> if we would to keep it this way and until until we get more guidance on how to how to do a hybrid yeah I assume we have to continue if there is no um, motion to uh, change it Mr. Breezy please go ahead 
not a motion, just just for my own clarification. Um, I, I, there was I with the hybrid approach. My thought was Zoom could continue, or or Google Meets or some other method. There's there's absolutely no um, no want um, from me asking this question or discussing it to to limit the public participation. I, I think quite the opposite. I think it's been this has been a, a tool that's enabled us to communicate with the public like quite frankly, what, like we never have before. Um, and just in tonight's meeting, we saw Dr. Mingo was able to answer, I think every question that got asked uh, from a public commentary perspective, which I think is, uh, you know, speaks volumes on using technology to communicate. I just, I, I think there's another side to this or another piece to this uh, where I, I, I don't see any downsides to having um, some members of the board in person, like traditional meetings, that's all, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Mrs. Song, please go ahead. After that, Ms. DiMaggio. Yeah, continuing on this topic, not the next topic. Um, we've had the benefit of being able to post videos of these Zoom calls. Um, videoing our board meetings is a conversation that comes and goes and comes and goes. And I think that as we begin to look at what is an available hybrid model, we need to address the fact of whether or not um, a continuing of continuing to make videos available of our meetings is something that the public would want. Thank you. I also saw Ms. DiMaggio. Thank you. Um, maybe just to get some more information, it wouldn't hurt. Can um, Dr. Mingle, can you please ask Matt G for his, uh, or get a feel for what's going on in other districts? Um, yeah, that would be useful. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Anybody else? I see nobody. Thank you. Is there any other uh, new item? Ms. Sohn, could you please go ahead? Yes, thank you very much. I'd like to speak about the uh, Warren Middle School yearbook. Um, just so that I'm, I'm going to just articulate what I understand is, is the set of facts here. The 2019-2020 um, Warren Middle School yearbook was assembled and distributed and it had an error and it was a mistake. Um, the Spring was tough and uh, the people that were assembling this were put into um, at-home situations and inadvertently um, in 17 pages of the yearbook, a border was chosen which um, and made it into the book and was distributed, which displays uh, religious imagery, uh, specifically a Christian cross, um, angel wings, and the word believe. And the, this border appeared on, I believe, approximately 17 pages of the book, um, the entire eighth grade section. Um, I, I use the words mistake and inadvertently very purposely because the administration has, um, and the building administration, everybody I've, I've spoken to, all the communications I've seen, everyone agrees this was inadvertent. This was not intentional. <laughs> This was just a, t a terrible mistake. Um, and mistakes happen. And, I, you know, so I don't, I don't see the benefit of spending a whole lot of time um, on the mistake part of this. I know the administration is going to address how we um, prevent those types of mistakes in the future. But how you deal with the mistake really matters. I think in this case, maybe it's the only thing that matters. Um, we have, we are a public school system and the middle school's public yearbook for the graduating class of 2020 and for the sixth and seventh grade has 17 pages, which have borders of Christian imagery. And I don't think that that is, how we deal with that should depend upon whether or not an individual parent is offended or two parents or 10 parents. Um, I don't think the level of offense that somebody feels over this is relevant at all. I think we, this book shouldn't exist, frankly. Um, certainly it shouldn't exist in its current form. Um, 
so I, you know, I feel very strongly that no parent should have their own personal keepsake, have imagery that they are not comfortable with. But more than that, I think no parent should know that out there in the community are hundreds of yearbooks with imagery surrounding their children and other children that they're uncomfortable with, um, particularly not religious imagery. Um, it's irrelevant to me whether it's Christian or any other faith. I don't think that should have to be said, <laughs> but I'm saying it. Um, I really feel that the only appropriate response is to the best, to the extent that we best can, those yearbooks should be retrieved. I know that's an imperfect solution that you can't make people give them back, but you should ask. And I think that, you know, everything I know about the Warren community is that they are the type of people who would bring them back. A complete reprint of the 2019-2020 yearbook should be done and distributed without the imagery. Um, if there are any books not yet distributed, they should, of course, not be distributed. And that this should be at no cost to the recipients. I am prepared to make a motion to that effect, um, but I certainly would love to hear the feedback of um, the rest of the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comment? Mr. Franco, please go ahead. Yeah, I agree with with everything everything Mrs. Zone said. I mean, uh, separation of, of church and state is 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 quite critical to it's to the way we do things. Um, uh, I would also like to acknowledge that the people who made the mistake have acknowledged that they were the ones who made the mistake and could, took the blame for it and responsibility. Um, I do think these books need to, to the best we can, uh, be retrieved and new ones um, issued, as Ms. Zone said, at no cost, no additional cost to uh, the people receiving them. So I would be in favor of that. Thank you. Mr. Bellish. Sorry, Mr. Bell, and I apologize. My hand was raised from the previous session. Understood. I don't have, I don't have anything to add. Anybody else? Mr. Vichy. Would, uh, there's a question. Uh, the cost, I guess, would be the, the township's cost and not the yearbook company's cost. Is that right? Or do we know that yet? Yeah, because I understood that it was difficult to make the image out when we have contracted to print the yearbook. The, the, the website was difficult to make out is what I thought I had heard. And only when they saw the actual printing was it very obvious that it was a religious border and they looked like, I don't know, plus signs or something in the original write-up. So I'm just wondering if there, I agree with what Mr. Franco and Ms. San said. I just, uh, kills me to spend a lot of money uh, to reprint all these yearbooks when a, a lot of parents and families are okay with the yearbook as it is. Um, so it's just a money thing to me. So I don't, I don't know the exact cost, but I, we should assume that we would pay the full cost, uh, minus there are, in addition to this issue, there are parents who paid for personalization of their yearbook. And that was not followed through on, even though it's in the agreement with the yearbook company. So we would look to be getting that cost removed, obviously, because the parents and resolving that problem with any reprint. So maybe it wouldn't be 100%, but it would be close to it. Well, uh, do we know what the cost is? I don't, I don't have that tonight, no. Right. Mr. Sohn and then Mr. Frankel, please. I would certainly hope that in negotiating with the vendor that we remind them that religious materials should be clearly labeled possibly even under a separate drop-down menu, firewalled away from public schools being so easily able to do this. I, I looked at the way in which this border is displayed. It was in alphabetical order right after asterisks. <laughs> 
So, uh, you know, this is a, a pretty, I, I would certainly hope that every, and I'm sure you are, you're negotiating it. I would certainly hope that that is a factor, that there's blame to share here, and that that should be a factor in what the final cost is. But for the purpose of what we, the guidance I'd like to see given to the administration tonight, I don't think the cost ultimately is going to end up being relevant. And, and that conversation has been had already um, with the vendor, and we would certainly bring it down as much as we can, but I agree with you. Direction of what to do next, regardless of that, I think would be best. Mr. Franco. Yeah, I just want to address Mr. Bishi's uh, comment that some parents may be comfortable with the books that they have in their possession already. But the fact of the matter is, um, there are other kids that are featured in the book that are surrounded by religious symbolism whose, whose parents, not the owner of the book, but whose child's image is in the picture that is surrounded by religious imagery that may not be comfortable with that existing. So whether or not you are comfortable with the book as it is, you need to have everyone, I believe, comfortable. And by removing the religious imagery is the only way to do that. Logistically, um, how would we remove these books from parents that are not willing to hand them out? There's nothing you can. I mean, you get to ask for them. That's yes. it. In that case, we're not, we're not, we're not going to go beat down doors and ask <laughs> and try and retrieve the books. We're going to ask, right? And that, if people want to give them back, they'll give them back. If they don't, they don't. That's that's their choice. I mean, in that case, I assume it makes some, it makes more sense to ask for a real number of um, uh, books that we need. I don't know. No, you ask. You ask for all the books back. You ask for. You ask for them all back. You place an order for a duplicate number of what you originally ordered. Whatever that number was, you're ordering that number of it. You know, replacement books. And then. I'm like, I'm, yeah. And, and then and you. A, you ask, a, sorry. Go ahead, Patricia. I'm sorry, Mark. Go ahead. Uh, right. And and not to not to throw fuel on the fire. I mean, we we did receive correspondence from another member who worked on the yearbook at a different school who said when she did the review, it was clearly evident during a diligent review of the borders that this was a religious imagery. So I don't know that the yearbook company is entirely to blame. Um, and I don't know, I, I didn't look to see how it was presented on the website and how they coordinated, but we did receive, we did receive correspondence from someone else who said, they saw it and it was clearly religious imagery and they were, because they wanted to use something like that and they noticed it and they removed it from consideration. So that that's out there as well. There is a responsibility that we as a school district have to absorb. And if that's the cost of the yearbooks, it's the cost of the yearbooks. Just Mr. Bishi, please go ahead. Thanks. Just uh, along Mr. Bellman's line of thinking, if we could save a buck though, if, if people do not want a replacement book, yeah. why spend the money? Are we going to, um, I would like, to, it would be useful to know the cost because if half the people are okay with their book and they don't need a replacement book, I don't know why we have to spend money on a replacement book that you name it, 50% of the people won't want to, uh, are we making a point here? If, if we're, why, I would like to know the cost that we're talking about here because if half the people are gonna keep the book as they have it already, are we spending 50% of the cost just to make a point? Just to, to send these books to the families anyway? And maybe it's not, a, if this is $10,000, I don't care. If it's $100,000, then it, maybe we should talk about it. Or maybe you have an order of magnitude, I don't well, know. Well, the, 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 point, the point, Mr. Bishi, is that we don't, we don't endorse religious imagery in public school materials. I mean, right. it's, it's a fairly Understood. significant issue to no me, at, at least. So uh, it's just because someone has the book and they're okay with it, we should still try and get it back. Yes. And if we don't, we, we don't spend all. the money don't on a still... replacement book? Yes. We've, we've taken the measure of removing the imagery from any book that's in existence. If a parent doesn't want to give up the one that they have, I mean, we're not going to send the police to their door. But as a school district, we have to take the responsibility to say this imagery should not exist. It shouldn't be in the books. And we've taken every possible measure to remove it. 
Including spending money on a book that the parent... Including spending money on a book that a parent doesn't want, yes. And what do we do with that book? I don't know, Mr. Bishi. Okay. No, I, I'm not putting you on the spot, yeah. Mr. Franco. I'm just trying to... Because I, you know, I was trying to think it through myself, and I was thinking that my kid would ask a non-Christian to sign their yearbook, and maybe that would be offensive to the non-Christian kid. Like, I was trying to think it all the way through. But I think it's at a higher level, Mr. Franco, that's a better way to think it through. Just, if I may, Mr. I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry, was it me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, parents have to consent to their students being in this book because this imagery is then held by everybody. Dr. Mingle, did they not have to consent to be in this book? I gotta think the consent did not extend to a consent that their child would appear in, you know, surrounded by or in a book where the entire eighth grade is surrounded by religious imagery. Uh, I, it, this is the books just got to go away. Now, if, you know, people going to hold on to it. Like Mr. Franco says, we're not going to send the police to their door. But this is not. This doesn't rise and fall on whether or not a percentage of the stu of the population themselves are personally not offended that the book is in their hands. That's not the measure of this at all, in my mind. You know, I, I'm voted up, voted down. I'm prepared to make a motion on this. Any other comment? I'm seeing Mrs. Chu. Please go ahead. Sorry, I thought already is it wasn't the response. Wasn't it already to collect what we could and replace those books? Isn't um, I'm, I don't know what your motion does because isn't that the yeah. current response? So we haven't we haven't announced a recommended response yet. I share oh. with the board things that the administration was working on to get information from the company about their ability to replace and what the cost would be. Um, but giving us direction of the board's preference would make that a much faster and easier process because then we're not coming back again with, you know, two weeks from now with here are the options and all of that. And is there, um, oh no, I'm good. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing no comment, Mrs. Sohn, please go ahead. I'd like to make the motion then uh, resolve that the Board of Education of Warren Township directs the administration to one, make every best effort to retrieve and collect all copies of the 2019-2020 Warren Middle School yearbook and two, provide for the reprint of the yearbook omitting the use of any religious borders or any other imagery inconsistent with Warren Middle School's mission as a public school and three, distribute the new yearbook to all who purchase the yearbook at no additional cost to the purchasers. Second that. You're muted, Pat. Sorry. Before I take a roll call vote, Mrs. Zahn, I'm going to ask that you email me the actual language. Yes, would you like me to read it again in the meantime? Does anyone need it read again? Please, I think that clarifies it, yes. Okay, I'll read it again. Resolve that the Board of Education of Warren Township directs the administration to, one, make every best effort to retrieve and collect all copies of the 2019-2020 Warren Middle School Yearbook, and two, provide for the reprint of the yearbook, omitting the use of any religious borders or any other imagery inconsistent with Warren Middle School's mission as a public school. And three, distribute the new yearbook to all who purchased the yearbook at no additional cost to the purchasers. I have the motion made by Mrs. Zahn and seconded by Mr. Franco. Mr. Bellish. Yes. Mr. Bishi. Abstain. Mr. Brzee. Yes. Mrs. Chu. Yes. Mrs. DiMaggio. Yes. Mr. Franco. Yes. Mrs. Zahn. Yes. And Mr. Bellman. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Any additional new business item? I was not made aware of any before, but is there anything? 
Oh. In that case, we're oh, moving wait, on. Mr. Bell. <laughs> Please go ahead, Mrs. Chu. Um, I think last week we talked about forming a committee. So I don't know if this was unfinished business or new business um, on creating some sort of town hall. And we didn't really resolve this last week. And so I wanted to bring that topic back up. And, and I know there were some volunteers within board members that would pick that up in a separate committee. So um, I wanted to open some discuss back discussion on that. Thank you. I want to, I will start with that where the current status is. There were two um, board members that reached out to me about volunteering. The current status is that this is a board goal um, for this year. And once administration has implemented the back to school plan and um, brought all of our children back into successful either remote learning or the hybrid learning, then we want to spend time on discussing that further and working with our legal counsel on making changes to our um, board policies and um, discussing that in more detail. Okay, thanks. But if anybody has anything else to add to that, please go ahead and let us know. Anybody having anything to add to that? Thank you, last call. Items under new business. Mr. Bellman, I was just asked to report on Mrs. DiMaggio's behalf that her laptop charger died. She apologizes, but she has left the meeting. Thank you very much for letting me know. Last call for new business items. In that case, I'll move over to public commentary. The same rules apply. Blocks are 15 minutes, three minutes for each speaker. And please announce your name and street address and also turn on your camera for those on the call that are hearing impaired. The first participant is Danielle Lader. Hi, Danielle Lader, 65 Briarwood Drive East in Warren. Um, I just wanted to thank the board for their decision to reprint all the yearbooks. And I just need to say to Mr. Bishi that it's not a money issue. It's a fact that we should be an inclusive school district and it is a separation of church and state. And Mrs. Zahn, thank you for bringing up that religious symbols don't belong in a yearbook. And it was a mistake and the mistake was owned, but we teach our children that once we make a mistake, we need to fix the mistake. And by having just the yearbooks replaced for the children who request the yearbook mistake just makes those kids stand out even more. And by replacing them for everybody just makes it the fact that everyone has the same yearbook. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for your decision to reprint the entire yearbook. Thank you very much. Next participant is Rachel Singleton. Thank you. I, I wanted to go back to what was discussed earlier um, in the evening about um, the learning that the hybrid model and learning in school. So I wanted to ask what with this hybrid model and what was what has been discussed and presented this evening what is the benefit of my children being in school for in-person learning when everything is being um, geared towards there being no difference between in-person in school and distance learning and then also i wanted to um second what uh, mrs lader had said uh, about the the yearbook uh, to mr bishi that it shouldn't matter and it's it's not acceptable that it was christian um iconography or if it was a picture of muhammad or a picture of a satanic um symbol um the fact is that the mistake was made it was owned and that those books shouldn't exist and that mrs Zulma was quite right in her insistence that um, the board or, or the school district should cover the cost of the mistake that was made, or bit, you know, a, a, and it was admitted that it was an honest mistake. So thank you again, Mrs. Song. There you, thank you very much, Ms. Singleton. Mrs. Rosa Krause, please. Oh. Uh, hold on one second, I'm going to turn on my video. Um, Rosa Krause to Holly Drive. So my question is, say for example, we do have an outbreak and we have to go, the entire school has to go into the a full distance learning. Um, 
would the teachers be able to at least remain in classroom to continue the teacher to continue teaching um, and just have the students at home or will then everybody just go home um, I think it would be easier I don't know from a teaching standpoint of view um, that they would just can have at least them because you could still social distance right it would just be them in their classroom um, or will they not be able to go back into school like it was back in in the spring that was my my only question so if we go go to full distancing can at least the teachers remain in school so that they have all their supplies everything at hand versus going crazy with going back to school and because I, I know that was some of the things that were happening in the spring sometimes they were going to school they hadn't a lot of time then they had to go back home and you know we all know that at home we have limited supplies so that was my only question regarding the teachers if they had that capability um, should we get to a full sort of lockdown thank you thank you very much great question um, mrs. Darby Finkelstein please Hi, um, I just wanted to quickly again um, thank Mrs. Zahn for uh, what you did tonight uh, with the yearbooks. I am one of the very squeaky wheels that was reaching out to a number of you um, when the yearbook uh, issue came up. It was something that I wasn't going to act on and then the more I thought about it, the more I was important. I did feel very silly um, at the time. Sending messages about this is, is obviously a very crazy time. Everybody, I mean, we're trying to figure out how our kids are going to school. So this felt like, to me, I wasn't sure it was the right issue to be discussing at this point. And I do appreciate that, um, Mrs. Zahn, you did feel that it was important. It was right to focus on this now, um, despite everything else that's going on um, that we could be focused on with our time. So I do appreciate you taking the stand uh, that you did because I think it was the right one. Uh, it's the right one for our kids and for our community at large. So thank you. Thank you very much. I see Mr. Todd Jokey. It's actually Jacqueline Jokey at Nine Heritage Drive, Warren. Um, and I guess I just want to reiterate um, some questions that I didn't hear an answer specific from Dr. Mingle on in regards to who and how exactly can parents find out what the academic content benchmark standards are for a particular grade. So that way in this hybrid distance learning model, if they want to know what their child should be achieving from an educational standpoint during the academic year, what they can focus on um, if they're trying to assist and prioritize. Because I think based on the previous experience, there was, you know, a lot of interaction and work being done, yet I'm not sure if the parents understood what goals were being achieved by the work and what um, outcomes were educationally were being met. Um, so I think it would be helpful if there could be a cohesive curriculum or at least guideline for parents that this is what first graders should be able to do and, and possibly what resources there are to help teach your child um, outside of what they may be getting in, in the um, distance hybrid model. Thank you very much. Next, we have Ms. Catherine Held Abel. Hi, Catherine Hill Ebel, 228 Mount Horeb Road, Warren. Um, I just wanted to clarify one of my earlier questions because I think I it might have been misinterpreted. Well, I was asking earlier um, about attendance policies, and obviously I was being facetious when I was, you know, speaking about a truant officer knocking on a door. I wouldn't expect something like that to happen. But um, what what my concern is is as we start to, you know, slowly regain more normalcy there are going to be more checks and balances that are going to take place and there are you know policies and procedures still exist so technically speaking you know if we're if we're if we have the expectation to be you know being vigilant and keeping our children home because you know even say for the sniffle that we wouldn't have kept them home for earlier um i 
I just want to know like where, where the scale starts to tip in the wrong direction. Um, my concern is number of days that would keep them from advancing to the next grade, things like that. Um, you know, obviously we're kind of, there's a very, very great area with, with the rules and policies and procedures right now. But as we go back to school and as things become, you know, s slowly more normal, there, these policies are going to pop back up. And I just, I would rather have clarification in the beginning, you know, as to if there's going to be a change. I mean, I really think there should be a change with these circumstances. And it's just one of those things that I feel like kind of got lost in the shuffle and was never addressed even on a statewide level. Um, so I just wanted to get a little more clarification regarding, you know, we normally have a certain amount of days that it's, you know, 20 something days. I'm not sure what it is. And what, once your kids surpass that, if they don't have a doctor's note, I mean, obviously we're not traveling back and forth to the doctor in the middle of all this for something like a snipple, but if it's concerning, you know, if it's concerning enough where you don't want them to be in school because of all that's going on, you ought, I mean, I would assume that you would obviously want them to stay out. So I just want, you know, it's, it's that little you know, those little things that, that I think can pose as an issue down the road. Um, if we use too many days for, you know, something silly like a cold, but you want everyone to be proactive. So I just figured I would see if there's going to be something in writing, um, you know, to help support parents who do want to, who do want to keep their kids home if they're going, to, you know, I, I personally, I'm on the fence. I'm saying that my kid, you know, I've said that we're cho choosing hybrid. I'm, in the mindset that we're going to try it. And if it doesn't work, we're not going to do it. You know, like, so I'm one of these people that are teeter tottering and, you know, I probably would be one of the parents that had them absent more than others. So I just want to know in my head, like where, you know, where I should start to get nervous if they've been absent too many times, et cetera. And if they are absent, are they able to do virtual school on a day where they would normally be in for a hybrid day. Say they're homesick, but it's we are more at the three minute mark. Please wrap up in the next 30 seconds. Thank you. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next on the list, we have Mrs. Heather Silver. Please go ahead. You're muted. Mrs. Silver, you're still muted. Sorry, I know. Me being muted is kind of a an oxymoron. Anyway, um, I just wanted to say two things. First, I am grateful for uh, the oh, sorry, thirty five quail run, Heather Silver. Sorry, um, I uh, wanted to uh, say how grateful we are that the um, administration and district has worked so hard to put together uh, some sort of a schedule. Um, at least better than a lot of areas in our uh, surrounding districts. Um, and we are grateful for that. I am also extremely grateful on a personal level, on a multitude of platforms for Mrs. Zahn um, stepping up and feeling that uh, any kind of religious material in the yearbooks really is unnecessary. Um, I didn't plan on saying anything, but um, the fact that there seems to be so much um, kind of back and forth over the cost of it. Uh, look, I, I'm not a, a militant of any sort. I'm not asking anyone to demand their yearbook be returned. But it's as simple as, you know, we've reprinted new ones. Please return your old one when you pick up your new one. Again, can't force anyone to give it back and can't force anyone to show up there but the effort that's put out does not go unnoticed and we are grateful. Um, you know, all of the, the uh, groups in the town that uh, have all different kinds of backgrounds. I'm grateful my children are able to grow up in such a, uh, a varied uh, uh, nationality of, of families in their town that they go to school with. So, um, I, and I'm grateful that ours is recognized as well. So, Thank you for acknowledging that, Mrs. Zahn, and for pushing that through. And thank you from a lot of people that may not comment tonight. So, appreciate it. Thank you. Moving on to Mr. Adam Joya. Hey, Chris. Hang on one second, buddy. Hey, Chris. All right, so guys, just a couple questions. Oh, here's um, the woman's husband. <laughs> yes. Adam Joya, 14 Sugar Woodway. 
Um, just curious, this year, will we be getting students that typically receive grades uh, A through F, will they be receiving those grades? Um, with the distance learning, uh, we, we did some of the summer programs, there's a couple of hiccups, so I'm wondering, one, if there's a time schedule for the rollout uh, for students, teachers, and parents, uh, what that date would be. I'm also interested in training. Will those three groups be receiving training and the timing of that? And I'm also interested if there's any kind of user test acceptance done for the distance learning to avoid some of those hiccups we had uh, in prior periods. Um, and lastly, uh, I agree with all the decisions in the yearbook, but uh, I do agree with Bishi, Mr. Bishi, that I'd like to know what the price for the replacement is and how many. Um, we should know that. I, I know that replacing the yearbook seems like not a lot of money, but this is the death by a thousand paper cuts. Uh, we should have that information because that budget has to come from somewhere. I know that each school year we're running out and getting tissues and markers and everything else. Uh, $15,000, $20,000 to me is a lot of money. So I just want to know where it's coming from. And I think that information. Somebody has a fiduciary responsibility to the financials of the board. I don't know who that is, but somebody other than me should be asking that question. And that's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Goya. And we have Sophie Mehta. Hi, um, Sophie Mehta, 8 Cardinal Drive, Warren. Um, I just had two questions going back to the distance learning model. Um, I was hoping that we could just get a little bit more details, and maybe that is coming tomorrow, but um, from what I heard from Dr. Mingle, the teacher that would be in the hybrid model in the class would also be facilitating the virtual model, or maybe I'm incorrect on that. So I just wanted to get a little bit more color on, you know, who, is it a different teacher that's teaching the you know complete virtual model um if we can get a little bit more color on that and then the second question is around the preschool i understand that's an integrated five day in person but is there a virtual option for the preschool as well and that might have been passed but just two questions thank you thank you very much this was the last uh, user on the list that raised the hand that fits perfect as we're at the end of the 15 minute block in that case, I'll close the public comment and we'll give it back to, um, or hand it over to Dr. Mingle to answer these questions that were just asked. Thank you, Mr. Bellman. Um, let's see. And thank you for the clarification on the attendance question. I'll be able to address that better um, this time around. Uh, so the question about what's the benefit of coming in person if there's not going to be a difference. So I, I was thinking about this from my own perspective of making a decision. Um, here are the things that I see as being benefits, although I do want to say it's up to each individual family because their benefits or drawbacks might be different as well as their ability to support having a child not go to school in person at all. So even in a distance setting wearing a mask, there is a benefit, to, in my opinion, of being in the same space and feeling the same energy and body language and experience of being with peers. And it will definitely be different, and we wanted to make sure that came through in Mr. Tumick's presentation so that people understand that. But there is still, a, you know, getting off the bus or even out of a car and entering the school and being part of the school environment, I think, has a value in and of itself, even when that experience will look and feel different than it normally does. I also think it will make the transition back to full schooling down the road easier. Whenever that happens, the health and safety guidelines that are in place now are very likely to still be in place. And the experience of going to school in a setting that looks and feels different might be easier to ease into two or three days a week than for it to be every day. I don't know for sure. It's hard to predict where we'll be a month from now or six months from now or whenever that case comes. But I do think the ease of transition might be easier for students. There's also going to be times of the day, like when they're outside and we can keep distance and be in some kind of physical activity or, you know, a, you know, game playing and all that, where it will feel mostly normal, where when you're outside and distant, you can take off your face coverings, you can play games, you can be, and I think that that's a benefit as well. Academically, our charge from the state is to make it as compar comparable as possible, which is both a, a blessing and a curse, right? So it, it can't, 
be exactly the same because the nature is different. But those are just some of the things. I think it's some of those more of the social emotional side. We're going to do the best we can to make sure that the kids who are at home all the time feel connected to their, their classroom community. Uh, but there is a difference in engaging via technology than there is when you're face to face. Um, the question about can the teachers remain in classroom if we go to full distance, it very much depends on the situation. So if we, are, if we go to red in the new Department of Health guidelines, that means the school facility is closed like it was last spring, which means nobody goes there. So if the facility is not safe for students to be there, then it's also not safe for our staff to be there. However, if there's a situation where some pod of students or a group here or there, it might be possible that staff members are still in person. So it's very dependent on the facts at the time. But if the entire school is closed, I would imagine that would apply to our staff as well. Um, as far as finding out academic content, there are a couple things. Um, first of all, once we get, once everybody's assigned to their homeroom teachers and we reopen, we're already talking about what a back to school night looks like in a virtual setting. Because obviously we're not gonna be in a place where we can bring a hundred parents at a time into a school facility uh, and making sure that parents know exactly the information that Mrs. Jokey asked about what is the academic content for my child in this grade level? What is that going to look like? Our curriculum is all available on the district website. Obviously there were adaptations that had to be made in the spring and so there will have to be adaptations now as well, but the classroom teacher is the first go-to person for the details of that grade level in that school. From there, the principal is the next step and Mr. Kimmick is the step after that. So that's kind of the progression if you're feeling like you're not getting the right answers or it's, you know, it's unclear. But one of the things we shared in draft form with the curriculum committee earlier tonight, which will become public down the road, is very detailed planning models where teachers will work together to make sure that those things are consistent. Uh, as far as the attendance, so actually under existing policy, we do not have to hold students back or not allow them to progress in their education just based on attendance. Um, that is typically seen at a high school level where there are requirements for graduation. We don't, we're not obligated to follow those same kinds of requirements. We send home notices when students hit a certain level of uh, absence, but we would definitely agree that if a student is not feeling well, that they stay home. Same thing for a staff member. If that means that if they're well enough where they can stay home and, and engage through distance learning, they should definitely do that. That's one of the benefits of where we landed with the model where the teacher is consistent and the homeroom assignment is consistent so that they can go back and forth more easily. That's a big advantage of the model. Um, whether they exceed a number doesn't necessarily mean that we don't move them on to the next grade or that they don't qualify for a program, even under our current attendance policies. And the state guidance says that we should not penalize students for abiding by stay at home guidance. So, I agree totally with the sentiments there. We'll make sure that that's clear um, as we go forward, like in the handbooks and that sort of thing. Um, will students receiving grades as traditionally they do? That conversation came up at curriculum committee. The instruction subcommittee of the return to school group is working on the answer to that question. I don't have it right now. It, there are differences by grade, um, but as soon as that is, you know, a recommendation comes from the instruction subcommittee, that'll be communicated out. Um, is there a time schedule for the rollout? I'm not. So earlier we talked about that process. Tomorrow parents will get communications about which cohort they're in, A or B, as well as additional information about the schedule moving forward. Next week, parents will get the specific homeroom assignment, um, which brings us you know, to what everybody needs to get back into school. Um, from the very first day of school, the hybrid model and distance learning models are in effect. There will be a, a pickup procedure that'll take place during the latter part of the week of August 31st, that week when the teachers are back, but students are not, we're picking up computers and materials and that sort of thing. Um, training is, is also taking place that week, and I, we mentioned earlier in Mr. Kimmick's presentation that one of the things our teacher teams are working on right now would be the parent resources that go along to support that. So that, that is something that will be coming as well. Um, I mean, I'll finish up the return to school and then I'll go back to the yearbook question. Um, the preschool option, I think, so preschool is very different than the other grade levels. So I would recommend uh, reaching out to Mr. Cook directly or Mr. Ressa tomorrow with a question about options for preschool if uh, you haven't already contacted with them because the, the options are a little bit different and the ability to support full distance learning um, is much more challenging depending on the needs of this child, the age of the child and so on. So I would recommend reaching out um, because I think it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of a discussion more details about the teaching co-teaching. So the way the model is gonna roll out is that 
a student is assigned to a homeroom teacher, regardless of their grade level, even at the middle school. And that is, you know, and that person is responsible for them at, at home and at school. But at each grade level, we're assigning additional certified teachers to be, you know, extra help, if you will, from our, by reassigning teachers from other areas, we can consolidate some places because of distance learning numbers so that there's additional support. So that on a day when maybe there's a lot of students at home, we might have somebody else who can pull some small groups and give additional attention. But there is still the, the homeroom teacher of record will not change for that student. Um, and that's what will be communicated next week. And more details about the price of the yearbook replacement. As soon as we have the answer to that question, it'll be, it'll be provided to the Board of Education. That's, it's, they're the ones that have that responsibility to oversee that we are doing um, everything right as far as purchasing under Mrs. Lenhart, myself, and, and everything else. So that'll go as soon as we have it. I believe I hit all the questions. Um, if I didn't, everybody knows where to find me. I'm happy to respond uh, to follow-ups tomorrow. Thank you much, very much, Dr. Mingo. With that, we're moving to agenda item 16. Mrs. Sohn, could you please? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second is Mr. Franco. All yes. those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? The meeting is now adjourned. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. You as well.